Welcome back everyone to the final day of the Biodesign Challenge Summit 2020. It's a big day, happy Juneteenth. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna thank our collaborators and sponsors. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts, Science Sandbox, MANA, Biofuels Digest, Ginkgo Bioworks. Thank you to Caring, Zymergen, Galley, Pivot Bio, SOS Ventures, XRC Labs, and Alginet. I also wanna thank our collaborators, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Thank you to Joe and Anna for teaching our students about circular design. Thank you to Parsons for offering a home to the Biodesign Challenge. Thank you to Future Tense. Uh, Tori Bosch will be here very shortly, uh, but thanks to her for working with us. It's, uh, it's fantastic to work with my old editor again. Thank you to Mission North for helping with our communications. This is our second year working with them. Thank you, Sarah, Jordan, and Yulia. Also, thanks to our new partner, Cumulus Association. We're looking forward to the academic community of bio designers that will be growing with you. And finally, last but not least, thank you to our technical producers at Argus HD. Uh, we could not have done this event without working with you guys. Um, special thanks to Jeff and Mark in the booth working behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Tim for orchestrating this partnership. And thanks to one of our judges, Nathan Allen, for making the introduction to the Argus team. Once again, thank you, Argus. Yeah. This has been fantastic. And thank you for joining us uh, over these last couple of days. Uh, and we also want to thank our mentors, all the artists, designers, scientists, and so many more in our community who took the time out of their schedules to visit our classrooms during the semester and help the students realize their projects, projects this year. Uh, a very special thank you to our judges. Um, it's an honor to be among such incredible minds every year. Our team appreciates the time, dedication, and love you put into this competition. And lastly, of course, we want to give props to our students and instructors. You all make this competition as special it is, as it is year after year. Um, and it was incredible, ins incredibly inspiring to see you overcome such crazy, insane odds this semester um, to develop fantastic projects. So each and every one of you is a representative of your classroom, school, country, and you make us very, very proud. So well done to all of our finalists, all 50 something of you. Um, and uh, we just wanna you know, do a very quick round of applause for, for all of you. Okay, so congrats students. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Alex. Uh, I wanna share just a quick uh, agenda for the day with everybody. So over the next hour and a half, we're gonna be sharing our top student videos voted on by the judges. Uh, we will be announcing those top six very soon. We're, we're giving these announcements, announcements to give a little bit of tension uh, to the online space. Uh, these videos will be followed by our speakers for the day. You probably heard us speak about them throughout the last few days, but we're really excited to actually have them with us today. And those speakers will be David Benjamin, uh, who's an architect at The Living, science fiction writer Annalee Mewitz, and editor Tori Bosch from uh, Future Tense. Uh, these talks will be followed finally by our award ceremony, uh, the moment everyone's been waiting for. Uh, we will announce the winners of the glass micro, our grand prize, as well as the rest of the special prizes uh, starting at 1.45 today. I hope you'll join us. Thanks, Alex, and thanks, everyone. All right, and now we're going to announce the winners of the sponsored prizes. So, the winner of the Science Sandbox Prize for Public Engagement is NYU IDM Microbial Memories. Congratulations, team. Woo! <laughs> and, and the winner of the MANA Prize for the Future of Beauty is Universidad de los Andes, Team Linneo. Congratulations. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> Let's air their videos. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Now, picture the first summer that comes into your mind. When was it? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Open your eyes and imagine a world where it's possible to capture those smells and flavors of your memory and use them in the kitchen. What if we told you that with the aid of microbial cultures, we might just be able to make that future a reality? Introducing Culture, microbial kits that bring your memories to life. 
Using cutting-edge genomics research, we are finding new ways to bring life to your kitchen. Our custom kits capture the smells and flavors of a particular time and place. And our recipes help you make your kitchen creations even more unique and delicious with a touch of nostalgia. We have work to do to make our vision a reality. But as we like to remind ourselves, the future always begins as science fiction before it becomes science fact. Hi, I'm Nick Hill. Hi, I'm Sarah, and we are the Microbial Memories team. You just saw a speculative vision that Nikhil and I imagined, one where we could capture moments in time with the aid of microbiomes and bring those flavors into our kitchens. Today, we want to share with you a little bit about our inspiration and the science that we're building off of. So first, let's talk about the science. Our vision involves creating a sense of time and place through flavor. And not just through fermentations of food, like what has been done already at the Noma Fermentation Lab, among others, but through a novel approach that builds on some emerging genomics research. We started with a question. How is a food's taste affected by its place? For example, if you tasted enough wine, you know that uh, the same grape made into wine in different regions can taste completely different. Why is that? To begin answering this question, we read the work of Nicholas Bukalic, uh, Susan Ebeler, and other researchers who have investigated the role of microorganisms in wine terroir. Terroir is the complex flavor that encapsulates so much information about that wine in the glass, where it's from, what climate was like, when it was made, the soil conditions, and, and more. All of this information comes together in the subtle nuances of flavor that could allow you to tell the difference between two bottles made from the same grape. Could it be that the specific microorganisms present in fermentation are a factor in the development of terroir? Uh, Bikalich and team conducted some experiments to explore that question in particular. First, uh, in their experiment, they took samples of pre-fermentation grape must, basically the grape juice, uh, before it becomes wine, and they extracted the DNA of microorganisms present and then sequenced their genomes to get a list of all of the species present in that grape must and the, their relative abundance. They did this across California for multiple types of wine in different regions, and after analysis, they found strong correlations between the microbiomes in these samples uh, and their corresponding geolocation, climate, and time of production. So in other words, if you were only given this list of species present and their abundances, you might be able to pinpoint exactly where that wine was made, from which grape, and at what time of year. Kind of like how an, uh, a trained wine taster can do exactly the same just from the taste. So we had two questions in response to this research. First, could we identify microbial terroir in other types of foods? And two, could we understand how microorganisms contributed to specific flavors? To answer these questions, we designed an experiment to explore whether we could identify a terroir in homemade yogurts that we made in our own apartments. But before we could conduct our research, COVID hit. So instead of investigating the connection between the microorganisms in our own yogurts and their unique flavors, we reviewed literature to learn more about the microbial basis of flavor. We studied research about metabolic pathways, the chain of processes in which microorganisms interact with their environments to produce molecules that we ultimately perceive as flavor. For example, we see tasting notes uh, for wine that say Meyer lemon, wet pebble, and unsweetened tangerine drop candy. We know that these flavors were not added to the wine. Instead, the molecules produced in these metabolic pathways might have evoked those scents and memories for the taster. Given the opportunity to carry out our own research, we would cross-reference the microorganisms in our own yogurt 
with known metabolic pathways to specify why my yogurt might have tasted totally different from the heels. But we're pocketing that for future projects when the lab is open again. If we had been able to do those experiments, uh, we would have shown more evidence uh, for a microbial basis of terroir. And we would have shown how specific configurations of microorganisms in our yogurts could lead to subtle uh, different flavors, depending on where they were made. So we started working from this assumption and we began imagining what this might have looked like in the kitchen, assuming our research had worked. Yeah, and that's where our idea for microbial flavoring or a microbial spice rack came in. We imagine taking the microbial terroir genome sequences that we compiled from samples from different times and places and creating flavors from them. We could imagine having a bottle of liquid with a dropper, kind of like bitters, uh, that could be used to kickstart a fermentation or even be dropped on a finished product for an extra touch. Really, we, we would expect cooks to use their creativity to find new uses for these flavorings, like any other ingredient. Nikhil, you used to be a chef. What time and place would you make into a flavor if you could? You know, it, it would be really interesting to add, you know, this whole new set of, of uh, options into the kitchen. Um, but right now, the main thing that's on my mind is the racial injustices that we're continuing to see in our country. Um, and, and as I, I think about the violence inflicted upon the Black American community here, um, I think about its roots in European colonialization. And it might not feel this way sometimes, but we're only a generation removed from the colonial era around the world. Um, my grandmother, who's alive, was a child during the British occupation of India not, not that long ago. Uh, and, and India wasn't even the last country to gain independence. So when I think about what time and place I would want to capture and use in the kitchen, I think about a time before colonial rule. I think about finding ways to capture the flavor of that period. I think about sampling DNA inside of an old fermentation vessel used in West Africa prior to colonization and creating a sort of like flavor of freedom. Um, I don't know what it would taste like, right? We don't, we don't know what bacteria would be in that sample, but knowing that those non-colonized species that we found in the sample would produce the flavors in our bottle, that would be enough for me. That surprise would be interesting. Um, every time we eat food, we're eating our history. And I think it would be so empowering to create an ingredient that allowed us to imagine recipes for an alternate world uh, without the legacy of colonial rule. I think that's super interesting. And I really would want to taste that and see what that alternate reality would taste like. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned colonization for another reason too. As you know, my research has focused on cultivating microorganisms for space exploration and settlement. And the language we use to describe uh, space exploration often uses the word colonization, like space colonization or space colonies, etc. And those words are so loaded, especially given the sovereign nations and highly capitalized private companies that are the two main forces backing missions. And these are the same two forces that backed colonization in the last millennium. But those words are also used to describe microbiomes, right? Microbial colonies can be diverse with many species of bacteria, fungi, protozoa living in the same environment. There could be power struggles just like ours, but there can be harmony as well. I don't want to be reductive and overly romantic here, but my broader thought is that we can travel space uh, as we travel space, we can take inspiration from microbial colonies to study how we can create a manifesto based on diversity and symbiosis uh, from the outset without repeating the same mistakes with, uh, made on Earth. Maybe we could create a diverse library of microbial cultures made with samples taken from people, foods, places all over the world. In other words, creating a microbial archive of human cultures and history on Earth that we can take with us as we explore the cosmos. Other artists have created similar works related to microbes and memories. Cecil Tolis, for example, collects smells from interesting places in a city and is able to recreate a city's essence through smellscapes. Also, Joan Wu's project of collecting hand biomes to use in fermentation could be another inspiration. Maybe we could collect these microbial samples and create a, a microbial broth 
to borrow a term from Alison Kotlin, that could remind the astronauts of home. Yeah, uh, I think all of these would be really interesting, right? C creating new flavors, creating a way of archiving memories and, and creating a new future um, as, we, as we settle space. Um, and I guess as we reach into the past and project into the future, one thing seems pretty clear. Uh, we need a diverse set of voices to help us imagine a better society, build on curiosity, empathy, and respect for life in all forms you know, macro and micro, right? Yep. Um, neither of us are scientists by training, uh, but we're committed to pushing the frontiers of biodesign. And we want to hear from many more voices that are often left out of these conversations. Um, so before we sign off, we want to highlight a couple of organizations that are doing work to expand opportunities in STEM. Uh, we're going to put these up on our slide. So please go to these links and consider supporting these organizations. Thank you so much for, for listening and we're excited to answer some questions. Thank you, everyone. Do you know what are the key ingredients in most cosmetics? The Journal of Applied Toxicology in 2009 stated that more than 10,000 harmful substances are used in cosmetics, and yet only 200 substances have been banned by the FDA. Does our skin suffer when we apply harmful ingredients? Let's talk about the skin around our eyes. Because it is one of the most sensitive and thinnest areas of our bodies, substances and toxic ingredients are absorbed quicker, causing allergies, skin sensitivity, and sometimes even cancer. In color makeup, eyeshadow's key ingredients are pigments. These animal and vegetable origin pigments often contain insecticides, fertilizers, and heavy metals. Ingredients that give color as orange, red, yellow, and black are of mineral origin, as for example, iron oxides. The shimmer you find in eyeshadows, highlighters, nail polish, and others is given by mica, a valued mineral within the industry for its ability to reflect and refract light. Also used are excipients and binders, where its most commonly used ingredient is talc, because of its lack of color and its strong humidity absorption. But what are the impacts behind the use of these ingredients? Iron oxides, mica, and talc are sourced from open pit mines, altering its ecosystem and causing overexploitation of minerals, not only harming the environment, but also the human body in the process. But what's not commonly known is a quarter of the world's mica comes from illegal mining in India, where over 22,000 children are submitted to forced labor in dangerous conditions placing their health and life at risk. Therefore, we present Lineo, a bio eyeshadow palette made completely from fungi.
palette contains six colors, each one corresponding to a specific fungi species. Fungi pigments act like a fungal armor, protecting the host from harmful environmental conditions such as solar radiation. The biopigments also act as bioagents. Bioagents boost the human organism when consumed. Just imagine what it can do to our skin when applying nourishing biopigments as it activates the skin and regulates exposome's repercussions. Why should you choose Linneo over the infinite possibilities in makeup brands? Because in addition to coverage, Linneo also provides nourishment to your skin. Our formula provides hydration, UV protection, antioxidants, and anti-inflammatory properties, decreasing the aging process around our eyes. All of this happens thanks to the bioagents fungi offer. Linnell addresses the situation by replacing harmful ingredients, therefore creating a socially, economically, and environmentally sustainable cosmetic. But why fungi exactly? Columbus Biodiversity has always been a great source of inspiration and research. We can find around 1,500 species of macrofungi alone. We went out, explored, fell down, got up and got dirty, initially finding more questions than answers. But we landed on a wooden mushroom from the forest near our university, and that's when Linnell's journey started. Our first attempts were unsuccessful due to the macrofungi fragility. However, it inspired us to explore further a kingdom full of color, leading us to discover filamentous fungi set in the way. How is all of this possible? An eyeshadow requires excipients, pigments, colorants, corrective, active, and preservative substances, but Linneo would only require two substances, pigments and binders. Pigments not only provide color to our formula, but also act like active substances, providing hydration, UV protection, anti-aging, and antimicrobial properties. The binder acts as an excipient and corrective substance. It thickens and smooths the formula while nourishing the skin. Using only two substances guarantees an ingredient reduction and lowering the nail's carbon footprint. The process starts by growing and incubating fungi in the lab. When the media is full of color, the culture is extracted, sterilized, and filtered. Liquid pigments are obtained and then dried and ground into a fine powder called Microma, a sterilized biopigment. Linnell can be escalated by using a bioreactor containing different compartments controlling airflow and temperature, ensuring fungi's optimal growth. The environment's light and pH can be regulated as well. The reactor's horizontal containers optimize culture space and pigment production, as fungi grow faster when cultured in larger areas with less depth. By controlling culture conditions as temperature, humidity, light, and media, we can obtain different pigmentation shades from the same fungal species. Pigments require binders, so eyeshadows can be applied smoothly and pressed back in a steel pan. Our binder is obtained by drying Ganoderma lucidum fungus. It has low rates of humidity, meaning that when dried down, the powder's volume doesn't diminish drastically. The resulting powder is colorless and rich in chitin, which is perfect for mixing color and nurturing the skin. Finally, pigments and binders are mixed together and the eyeshadow is ready to be pressed packed in steel pans and placed in the palette. We use different fungi to obtain both pigments and binders for our formula. As of now, we're working in six initial colors and obtaining approximately 3,000 eyeshadows in a 150 liter bioreactor. However, we are working on our biopigments optimal development. Now, to obtain a sustainable palette, we suggest using agroindustrial waste from Columbia's sugar cane industry, creating a biomaterial used for Linnell's eyeshadow containers and packaging. We propose this be made according to the agroindustrial waste available in each country to reduce costs and carbon footprints. Also, Linnell works with interchangeable refill pans, which will come in biodegradable packaging. Linnell is committed to respect the planet's biodiversity and our diverse communities. A refined cosmetic must be born from noble intentions. We present to you, once again, Linnell, Nourishing Beauty.
Next up, the judges made a special request to air a video they really loved. This is Parsons School of Design, Project Tom Text. Let's play the video. Hi, I'm Uyeng. I grew up in Da Nang, Vietnam, where leather textile predominantly manufactured. Leather is widely used in many applications across the industries, but not only my country. Around the world, people are suffering from leather manufacturers' pollution. Leather tannins use toxic chemical agents. Some can be harmful for the human health and the environment. Moreover, false leather is often made from toxic body urethane. It is plastic and at the end of the day, it does not biodegrade or break down. After working in the fashion industry here in New York for a few years, looking at the volumes of the textile materials never seen before, and the thread of microfiber, which is made from polyester, is entered into the rivers, lakes, and the ocean, and then appears to be consumed in food and drink. This triggered a deeper question for me, taking me back to the same one I have been dealing with in Vietnam. What if you can use waste to create a new generation of biomaterial that can solve the pollution problem? At I research, the food industry generates 6 million to 8 million metric tons of seafood cell waste every year. The seafood cell waste often contains a huge amount of cotton, a polysaccharide that can be biocompatibility, biodegradability, antimicrobial and antioxidant activities. Cotton and chitosan can be extracted by bacterial fermentation process. We produce almost 9.5 million tons of waste coffee ground every year, and most of it end up in landfills, where every ton generated 14 tons of CO2. By combining this waste component, I created Tom Test leather like biomaterial, material, which is dyed with eco friendly natural ingredients like orca, coffee, and charcoal. Tom Test would not only solve the textile leather pollution, but it would also move the seafood and coffee production into a better ecosystem platform. To me, Tom Test is not just a textile but actually a process. How can we start to look at the longer life cycle of the material and how can we bring the environment to impact from where this industry stands current? Tom Test's production carbon footprint requires only 1.64 kg carbon dioxide equivalent per square meter. This is 100 times less than real leather and 15 times less than forced leather cost. Real leather, in contrast, use 17,000 liters of water to produce 1 kilogram of leather. It's 69 times more than Tom Test's material. 
One pair of real leather shoes can take up to 9,000 liters of water. Fox leather is 1,800 liters. However, with the current process, Tom Tess would only take 31 liters of water, with the added benefit of being able to recycle. When Tom Tess by all material is no longer fits its purpose, it can be easily recycled into new product. You can put Tom Tess into water, let it stay for two weeks until it dissolves, and then it can be casted again into the mold. Tom Tess is 100% biodegradable. It is also a natural fertilizer for plant. Today's system is big, and people don't really know what happens to the waste. If people could take a part of more local system and a smaller loop, I believe they will begin to be waste at our raw material. A local and closed loop system will provide a sense of honesty and transparency in the area that is normally hidden. As a textile bio designer, my vision is seeks to reduce negative impact on the environment and improve the health and well-being of the people now and in the future. With Tomtest, I can see that alternative system of production and consumption are possible, and I recognize that material innovation will be crucial to achieve this. I believe that Tomtest can be a small movement to generate momentum and inspiration for wider actions. Thank you. All right, I think we've come to that point in the day uh, without Further ado, are you ready, Alex? I think we're gonna show the top six teams. I'm ready, Vina. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so our top teams are Hub for Biotechnology and the Built Environment, Kalina. California College of the Arts, Algae Filters. University of Sydney, Illuminate Pressure. College for Creative Studies, Zebra Glass. University of California, Berkeley, Thermosilk. And Estonian Academy of Arts, Algae as a Filter. Congratulations. Right. Congratulations to all of you guys. So we're gonna start with the video for a hub for biotechnology in the built environment. Take it away. Welcome to Kalina, the world's first gastro lab. We fused biotechnology, architecture, and design to create a new kitchen concept. Experience it for yourself. Kulina goes back to traditional processes of cooking, re-establishing our connection to the food we eat. Here, we air dry food in low humidity and low heat, using natural ventilation through air bricks. In this indoor farm, we grow organic fruit and vegetables. We use hydroponics, a method that uses nutrient solutions instead of soil to drastically reduce water usage and pest problems. These vertical panels are filled with grow stones, which we repurpose from glass waste for superior air and water retention. Irrigation is constant and controlled, ensuring a bountiful harvest all year round. Kulina's architecture emphasises how everything is connected. Everything that is generated is conserved and utilised fully, from heat to refrigeration. So you have our oven room to thank, not only for your food, but also for this dining room's cosy temperature. Speaking of which, please take your seat and make yourself comfortable. At Kulina, you don't choose a predetermined dish. Instead, you gather your ingredients, starting with your main. The algorithm suggests ideal combinations which suit your developing flavour profile. Here, you have a selection of pickles which complement your choices so far. After you've made your selections, we surprise you with your unique meal. Your dish is Mesosaurus Gravlax. Excellent choice! Mesosaurus has been extinct for centuries, but you can enjoy it today thanks to scientific leaps in protein production. No animal will be harmed in the creation of your dish. Would you like to learn about the technologies that makes this possible? Wonderful! This is where all our protein is made. From beloved favourites like chicken, beef and pork, to more exotic options like Mesosaurus, 
dinosaur meat and dodo poultry. Our chefs have even experimented with yet unnamed meats. It's all possible through Kulina Pro Yeast, patented perfusion bioreactor technology that harvests protein from genetically engineered yeast. Select from our range of cell pods, each a customised yeast cell line for production of your meat of choice. You can even design meats thanks to advances in synthetic DNA technology. Here, our yeast cell line is optimised to efficiently secrete recombinant protein via its secretory pathway. Proteins are transported into the surrounding culture medium and selectively filtered into a protein pipeline where they travel to a protein reservoir under high rates of perfusion. Proteins arrive at a second chamber where larger target proteins are separated by size exclusion chromatography. With the help of gravity and additional vacuum enhancements, the protein is forced down the column while smaller nutrient molecules are recycled back into the reactor vessel for continuous fermentation. Finally, protein molecules diffuse into a scaffold chamber where they bind to a macroporous 3D scaffold. The 3D matrix provides a structure unlike that of meat tissue where immobilised proteins begin to collect. And there we have it, clean meat with unrivalled taste and texture. As your chef finishes cooking your dish, let's see where the rest of your ingredients come from. Here in Kulina, the chef is not the only one creating your meal. We also make use of tiny energy, working with natural processes that transform, distill and flavour your food. These processes happen throughout the building, where the requirements of these microbial processes informed the architecture, making it a truly symbiotic environment for both microorganisms and humans. The tropical room obtains its humid environment from a sous vide bath for slow cooking. The humidity provides the perfect conditions for microorganisms like Aspergillus oryzae to multiply to produce a key ingredient, koji. Fermentation mostly takes place in the cellar. Bacteria and yeasts enable us to lacto-ferment fruit and vegetables, create interesting vinegars, and make the many flavours of kombucha we pair with our dishes. The refrigeration room is kept at a steady low temperature by evaporation cooling and natural insulation, so it doesn't use up a lot of energy. Once we've reached the flavour profile we are seeking through our microbial processes, we place the jars and containers in the refrigeration room to halt activity by reducing the microorganisms' energy levels, thereby maintaining the perfect taste until required. We end back in the dining room, which is as simple and natural as the food we serve. Everything comes together on your plate. Your dish is not just a meal, but a medley of tiny energy, biotechnology and human ingenuity. We hope that Torin Kalina made the invisible visible, adding richness to your experience and a sense of connection to your food. Speaking of which, your food has arrived. Enjoy your meal. You may be asking, how did this all begin? Kulina evolved when four students from completely different backgrounds came together with a shared love for food. I'm Emma, a molecular biologist. I'm fascinated by the vibrant potential of microorganisms for sustainable development. My current focus is on microbial cell technology for clean meat production. I'm Dawn from South Korea. My background is in user-centered special design. I helped Emma design a user-friendly bioreactor as part of a bigger immersive experience. I'm Pippa, the aspiring architect of the group. I'm working on creating a common language to make the invisible world of microorganisms an accessible design tool. Using tiny energy principles, ecological design can be encouraged to harness the abundant energy embodied in microorganisms. I'm Adrian, a medical doctor from the Philippines now studying innovation design. I'm investigating ways to introduce radical ideas through incremental changes by involving people in the iterative process. That got me interested in helping Pippa translate her ideas into an early prototype. When the unprecedented pandemic, COVID-19, brought the whole world to a standstill, flaws in our food economy began to show. And with it, a newfound urgency for sustainable innovation. These four friends saw this as an opportunity. The lockdown didn't stop them from doing what they did best, cooking up innovations. Combining their interests, they came together 
to create the very first gastro lab picnic. And with that, Kulina was born. An innovation using a mixture of ancient techniques and tangible biotechnologies imagined into one cohesive system. The aim of Kulina was to provide a solution with immediate implementation to prevent humans heading into a dystopian future, but an ecological one with strong connections to nature. What set it apart was a deliberate effort to work with nature, not to replace it, and to balance a complex science concept with accessible design. When Kulina first opened, there was praise and there was controversy. GMO or clean meat. Genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, have long caused controversy, despite evidence suggesting they do not pose any human health risk, but provide nutrient enhancements and economic benefits. We're not sure about the nutritional benefit. Farmers are losing jobs. I see it as an opportunity. I earn much more than when I was working the field. Vegan is no longer niche. It's a mega trend. The Colina prototype became a momentous open source experiment. Lawmakers started considering the gastro lab concept as an answer to food security. Scientists and chefs collaborated in the design of new meats. Colina's website became an open source cornucopia of recipes, resources and ingredients. Inspired by the founder's cookbook that made sustainable cooking techniques available to everyone. Architects are now exploring how to incorporate the concept into a residential tower block, replacing individual kitchens with a modified gastro lab running through the entire building. The vision is to ultimately integrate food security with modern life in urban cities. From a humble picnic to a gastro lab and finally to the home. Kulina is a testament to how biotechnology and design can come together to create ecological solutions for a sustainable future. And our next video is going to be from California College of the Arts, Algae Filters. The pandemic has changed every aspect of our lives and has created a new reality for everyone. A reality that not many can afford. Hello, my name is Camila Vandenberg and I'm a student at California College of the Arts. Because of the coronavirus, I was forced to leave San Francisco and move back home to Ecuador where I've been in quarantine for more than three months. Ecuador is currently struggling with providing proper biosuits and protection for essential workers and doctors. Face masks and filters are limited and expensive, only available for those who can afford them. 23.2% of our population earns less than $5.50 a day during normal working days. With the conditions right now, they earn relatively lower. Single masks are being sold by third parties for over $10 a mask, making this one of my major concerns as both an Ecuadorian as a, and as a designer. Due to the pandemic, I found myself distanced from my material and my design equipment, which posed as the ultimate challenge when creating and exploring with any kind of innovation. Nonetheless, I began to see what resources that I had, and I found a great amount of algae in my backyard pond. Algae is in the water to start with because of the nutrients created by the agricultural runoff. Harvesting it becomes a form of eco-remediation that will pull these harmful nutrients from the water since they have been incorporated into the algae, helping the water's ecosystem maintain its homeostasis. This is why I found out that algae is something that I find easy to source and cheap to find locally. In fact, I have contacted my local community and told them about my explorations with algae and possibly working with them. And they have connected me to a web of local gardeners that are in charge of taking algae from rivers, ditches, and even ponds 
around the area. This is a way I can find a solution to help my local community while also exploring with this innovation. And I'm proposing a cottage industry production where average people will harvest algae from stagnant local waters. And this advocates sustainability and maintains a low cost for the fabrication of filters and for this reusable face masks. The process for this project was to harvest the algae, let it sit for a few hours, and then wash it thoroughly, removing any possible debris like leaves and animals. After washing it, I began to sample the idea of hand felting it using hot water and vinegar. I added a three-part water, one-part vinegar solution on my algae. I discovered that because of the vinegar's acidity, it achieves the same results as if I were using bleach without becoming something toxic and harmful for the environment and for the plants. I wanted to continue to expose my felted algae to several disinfectant processes in order to ensure its efficiency. The solution that I found that worked best was the combination of rubbing alcohol and vinegar. This is something that is non-toxic but highly powerful when it comes to sanitation. I created an 80 to 20% ratio of rubbing alcohol, that is at least 70% isopropyl alcohol, and vinegar. This solution, I mixed it with tea tree, peppermint, and lavender essential oil. This added a nice refreshing smell to the solution as well as it worked as an antifungal, microbial, antiseptic, antiviral, and antibacterial agent in this solution. I researched various alternatives to filtering systems. For example, coffee filters have been reportedly used and proven by the Missouri s and to remove 23.1% of air particles. Per paper towels have also been tested as a potential filter and have been proven that two layers of them have captured 33% of 0.3 micron particles. Algae have absorbent properties that could potentially filter air, water, and other particles and solutions like metal. According to El Xavier's research of biochemistry, they have concluded that algae could potentially filter 90 to 95% of metal particles within 10 minutes. These sheets of algae together with the coffee filters and paper towels have created a biosafe filtering system with algae acting as a disinfectant and filtering agent that could be added to homemade filtering systems. Certified N95 masks are the respirators used in first world countries. They can filter up to 95% of the particles in the air that are 100 to 300 nanometers in size, certifying that it is potentially safe to use this amidst our current situations. However, these masks are scarce here. And unfortunately, third world countries find it hard to obtain these masks, exposing individuals to fake versions of them at a very high cost. With this as an incentive, I began to test the efficiency of the filter that I made. This filter was previously worn by an individual for a period of four hours when leaving the house to run some errands. The individual presented no sign of obstruction of the air as well as they mentioned that the essential oils felt calming and refreshing. They also mentioned that they not feel that their air was and their breath was being trapped and moisture was accumulating, like others thought were bought masks that they have used in the past. I wanted to conduct additional research and testing to see if my filter would still be efficient after that. So I decided to use an industrial vacuum and cornstarch to try this. Cornstarch has been proven to be the size of 0.1 to 0.8 microns in size. As an additional reference, cough aerosols in the air could potentially be the same size. I have attached a dark fabric to the vacuum in order to see any possible filtration. The results show that this, in fact, filters the air and at least filtered 95% of the particles in the air, making this a good filtering alternative for people that cannot access N95 masks or other certified filtering systems. This filter has been inserted in 100% reusable masks that has a pocket for the filter to go in and out so the individual can dispose of the filter after it's used and wash the mask afterwards. With minor funding, we would take this material to basic medical testing in the future. 
The pandemic has minimized our options, but has not stopped our creativity and innovation. Therefore, in the future, I envision the certification of this algae fiber in order to create potential filters for face masks, for people to be using and consuming at a low cost. But for now, I have created a filtering system using algae that not only offers the filtration of particles, but also offers a sanitized system with a pleasant smell at a low cost for people to have easier access to bioprotective products in Ecuador, assuring psychological and physical support for those who are currently facing the pandemic. And our next video will be from the University of Sydney, Illuminate Pressure. Have you ever slept in the same position for so long that your back or bottom start to go numb? It's not very comfortable, is it? Although it seems like a small issue for most of us, it poses a huge issue for patients in palliative and hospital care. Every year, approximately 60,000 people die of complications from pressure injuries. Additionally, it has been proven that individuals with pressure sores face a 4.5 times greater risk of death than people with the same risk factors without pressure injuries. Pressure sores are one of the most challenging clinical problems faced by patients who are elderly, immobile, neurologically impaired or experiencing acute illnesses. Affecting up to 32% of people admitted in hospitals, they can result in an array of damaging impacts such as permanent scarring, deformities, osteomyelitis, loss of limbs and sepsis. Not only does this cause problems for the individual, but it lengthens the stay of the patient, using up exceedingly more time and resources. But what are pressure sores and what makes them so bad? Pressure sores develop from injury to the skin and the breaking down of underlying tissue as a result of immobility. Simply put, when a person lies in the same position for too long, the pressure on certain areas of their body, usually the back, buttocks or ankles and elbows builds up. This causes the blood flow on these areas to become restricted, leading to injury to the skin and the breaking down of the underlying tissue. As most patients suffering from this issue are generally already immobile, conditions can worsen without regular attendance from nurses who are able to assist them in moving and shifting pressure. Looking into the problem, we discovered that pressure sores were an issue in more ways than one. Pressure sores are difficult to treat as many patients dislike being physically handled by nurses, causing them to become non-compliant. More modern solutions including air mattresses and compression stockings still depend heavily on nurse action and adds more pressure on top of their frenetic working conditions. In addition to this, the lack of communication and documentation between nurses on a patient's pressure sores, an unexpectedly common scenario, leads to their negligence and aggravation, resulting in further discomfort for the patient. However, it was also found that once a pressure sore was properly identified on a patient, very rarely did they increase in severity. As such, this allowed our team to narrow down the issue into the following statement. Pressure ulcers are difficult for nurses and doctors to identify, prevent and manage due to the fast-paced nature of their profession and environment. To solve this issue, we looked into ways we could sense and communicate pressure within an unobtrusive form factor. Light is one such method, and our team investigated bioluminescence. In our research, we were inspired by the Hawaiian bobtail squid. This deep sea creature houses a bacteria, a Vibrio fisheri, in its mantle. The increase in bacterial population density causes an accumulation of autoinducers, a process known as quorum sensing. The Lux CDABE operon is activated, and enzymes are produced, which catalyze the reaction for bioluminescence. In short, Bioluminescence is produced when this bacteria is clustered together. Our team, Illuminate Pressure, made up of six design students, two medical science students and one architecture student, worked together to implement this function into a practical design. Our vision is to transform and improve the hospital experience, making a less stressful environment for medical professionals and patients through user experience design and biodesign. Through much brainstorming, iterating and ideating, our research has helped us greatly engaging the effectiveness of our design as well as highlighting the factors to consider which influenced our final design. We ensured our product efficiently fulfills all aspects of user needs and wants when handling patients enduring the severe implications of pressure ulcers. We created a bioluminescent mattress topper with photo sensors to aid nurses and carers responsible for immobile patients. Our design aims to illuminate the serious implications of pressure-related injuries, specifically pressure sores, and create a compassionate user-based solution. This solution considers time constraints of healthcare professionals and strives to aid and confirm regularity of intervention, as well as a lack of patient comforts. Our solution utilizes a bacteria that glows under a certain population density, which is represented visually to notify medical staff to the development of increasing pressure due to lack of movement. So how does our product work? 
When a patient exerts body pressure onto the mattress topper, the force will push water out of the nanofiltration membrane. However, the large size of transformed E. coli will be trapped, leading to an accumulation of bacteria within the hexagonal pockets. Utilizing a transformation process in recombinant principles, the Lux City AVE operon obtained from aloe vibrio fisheri has been inserted into the transformed E. coli, thus taking up the properties of bioluminescence. As a result, the densely populated E. coli will produce and accumulate enough autoinducer, homoserin lactone, to chemically signal the transcription process of the gene responsible for bioluminescence. This is known as quorum sensing. We are able to manipulate this where it is controlled by body as well as automated pressure. The reaction is catalyzed by the main enzyme of the operon, luciferase, the cofactor, luciferin, and ATP provided via a sugar solution. Light is produced as well as the byproduct CO2. The light will then be amplified and redirected to a more noticeable location through fiber optics. This will then visually alert nurses to reposition the patient to avoid the development of pressure sores. The system can also be reused due to the incorporated automated pump. It is able to allow water to flow back into the hexagonal pockets, once again causing the bacteria to be suspended in the medium. Additionally, the pump will bring in the flow of nutrients, in our case a sugar solution, to provide an energy source for the bacteria as well as take out waste CO2. The water within the hexagonal pockets also acts as a waterbed where the additional function of the automated pressure pump is able to relieve pressure by alternating from draining and filling certain areas of the hexagonal pockets. Our design outshines other products on the market in comparison as it differentiates through using bacteria as a form of visual indication, rather than the conventional hands-on method which can be quite invasive. The beneficial features of our design includes a less hands-on approach of identifying pressure ulcers, improving nurse time efficiency, and minimizing invasive contact resulting in decreased stress and more comfort for the patients. The gentle light from the bacteria provides a therapeutic effect, and to reduce disturbance at nighttime, it can also be covered with a blanket allowing patients to sleep peacefully. Overall, our solution addresses our problem, that pressure ulcers are difficult for nurses and doctors to identify, prevent, and manage due to the fast-paced nature of their profession and environment. Our design addresses all stakeholders, incorporates bio design of necessity, and addresses our vision. We have been able to effectively design a solution that illuminates the serious implications of pressure-related injuries, specifically pressure sores, whilst creating an effective, compassionate, user-based solution. For more information on Illuminate Pressure and our product, visit our website at illuminatepressure.com. Our next video will be from College for Creative Studies, Zebra Glass. We like to define things by what belongs and what doesn't, because change means uncertainty, and uncertainty can be daunting. But stopping change is as impossible as stopping time, and focusing on the impossible is a distraction. What if instead of exclusion, we strove for balance? What if instead of eradication, we focused on utility? What if we embraced our environment the way it is, and we kept embracing it as it continued to change? And what if, when we stepped in to help, we did it not to destroy what doesn't belong, but to put what's out of balance to good use? We need to make invasive species material sourcing as commonplace as organic, post-consumer recycled, grass-fed, free-range, biodegradable, free trade, VOC, and hormone-free. It needs to be policy, but first, it needs to be designed. In our region, the Great Lakes region, the introduction and proliferation of zebra and quagga mussels have overwhelmed native species, their habitat, and our infrastructure. Efforts to remove them have been ineffective and in some instances, even more harmful to the environment. As color and material designers, we wondered what might happen if we treat them not as a biological threat, 
but as an overabundant material. We asked, what are they made of? And what can we make from them? Muscle shells are 95% calcium carbonate. Take them up to 1000 degrees Celsius and you get calcium oxide. Calcium oxide, lime, sodium oxide, soda, and silicon dioxide, silica, make glass. As bioaccumulators, zebra mussels filter the water. They filter out pollutants and plankton, minerals and trace metals, some of which give glass its color. A glass derived from zebra and quagga mussels will express the color of their ecosystem. Invasion, to region, to chemistry, to color, to identity, to belonging. We collected the first batch of mussels from Lake St. Clair, where zebra and quagga mussels were first introduced in the 1980s. Hitching a ride on ballast tanks of cargo ships from Russia and Ukraine. We boiled them, cleaned them, ground them up, and sifted them into a coarse powder. We worked out the chemistry, the molar calculations for mass and batch recipes. We designed the kiln program to pause on the way up to control the release of CO2 and H2O as sodium bicarbonate transforms into sodium carbonate, which transforms into soda, and as calcium carbonate transforms into lime. And as we paused on the way down and modulated the rate of cooling to swiftly transition through the vitrification range and to slowly drift through the anneal, It turns out the color of Lake Michigan glass is the color of icebergs and tropical atolls. The color of water. We're told it's a copper blue from the high copper content of Lake Michigan. It's beautiful and we can't wait to see the color of Lake Superior or Lake Ontario. We can't wait to see each lake, comparing glass from the beach to the lake bottom, taking a biochromatic tour of the water column. We can't wait to rediscover our region through the brilliant blues or greens, or even yellows or rose pinks of what we keep calling an invasive species. And we can't wait to see what we can make out of zebra glass. Next video will be the University of California, Berkeley, Thermosilk. An undergraduate team of biologists and engineers from UC Berkeley. We believe that applications of hornet silk can improve the lives of millions of people. We designed a flexible, biodegradable, thermoelectric textile that draws its inspiration directly from hornet nests. We believe that incorporation of this novel textile into the structure of emergency shelters can dramatically improve their quality and safety for inhabitants. There are more than 70 million forcibly displaced people across the planet 
of whom nearly 26 million are refugees. The COVID-19 global pandemic and the mounting consequences of climate change have made it undeniably clear that every nation and its inhabitants are vulnerable to displacement. And there is another field hospital going up, this one in Central Park. Not a moment too soon. We just learned there are 14 more reported deaths in New York City. This is one of the greatest challenges of our generation, yet current emergency shelters are anything but optimal. We designed ThermoSilk as a solution to two of these critical problems. We focus on the issue of connection to a dependable power source and a way to keep the temperature of a shelter stable in extreme heat. Access to electricity is critical in forming a livelihood in a modern world, yet 7 million refugees struggle with access to this basic resource. Lack of access to electricity is linked to detrimental impacts to health, education, and economic livelihoods. Access to electricity is linked to improved quality of life and lower mortality rates. Electrification has been shown to be directly proportional to increases in literacy, increases in study time for students, and improvements in gender equality. Households that were electrified saved 4% of their monthly expenditure by reducing their energy costs, yet emergency shelter housing too often fails to provide electricity for its occupants. Emergency living situations also fail to protect their inhabitants from unlivable weather. Standard UNHCR tents are rated to be safe up to 40 degrees Celsius, but average summer temperatures are well above that in many Middle Eastern and North African countries. It is in these dangerously warm areas that the majority of refugees live. A recent case study conducted within the Azraq refugee camp in Jordan reported that the internal climate of shelters regularly rose to temperatures deemed life-threatening for inhabitants. These conditions were observed for more than 20% of the year. Put another way, for a fifth of the year, many refugees' only shelter from scorching temperatures was deemed uninhabitable. Over half of the world's refugees are children, a population at especially high risk of heat-related illness. Homelessness is also a rising issue and is prevalent in many major cities, including our base, Berkeley, California. Recently, Homelessness has increased in response to high rates of unemployment and other conditions induced by the COVID-19 pandemic. Homeless populations and globally displaced refugees share many of the same hardships in regard to their living conditions. Roughly one-third of homeless mortalities in the Phoenix area are due to heat-related illness, a number that has increased dramatically in recent years. As climate change continues to place more and more people from every country at the mercy of worsening weather patterns, a solution becomes more important than ever. Humans are not the only species to build shelters to protect from harsh climates. Social insects have lived in inhospitable environments for millions of years, yet their bodies lack many of the complex homeostasis mechanisms that humans possess. Researchers report that hornets have an especially creative way of managing this. Inside their nests, hornets weave silk structures that store heat as electricity on hot afternoons, only to release this energy again as heat in the chilly night. This silk enables hornet nests to maintain steady conditions while the temperature outside fluctuates wildly, even at higher temperatures. Notice how steady the temperature in the nest remains. At ThermoSilk, we are incredibly excited by this research and see an opportunity to apply the Hornet's method of thermoelectrical regulations to human shelters. We believe that we can use the properties of Hornet Silk to convert excess heat to electricity during the day to use as a steady source of power. We can produce biodegradable Hornet Silk linings for compatible emergency shelters that will generate electricity from ambient heat. By converting heat to electricity, Thermal silk linings will also stabilize the temperature inside the emergency structures in which they are deployed. This means our silk can act as both a generator and temperature regulator. According to our research, on a hot day, one of our linings could produce at least 9.66 kiloamp hours of electricity. That's roughly 10 times the discharge of a conventional car battery. If redirected, this electricity could be used to power light bulbs and larger devices including medical equipment and food or vaccine refrigerators. 
Thermal Silk System promises to make emergency structures safer and to provide a higher quality of life to inhabitants while supplying access to reliable electricity. To synthetically engineer the silk, we begin by identifying key genes used to make the protein. Many of the genes used to make hornet silk proteins have already been identified in previous studies. These genes will be coded into a ring of DNA called an inducible plasmid. This plasmid will then be transformed through the cellular membrane into E. coli. We deemed E. coli to be the best vector to use in the research and development process due to its ease of use and versatility. Once the plasmid is transformed into E. coli and the bacteria are screened, the plasmids will be induced to start protein production. The proteins that are produced in the bacteria will then be extracted and spun to generate a thread. This thread will be woven into fabric using methods common in the textile industry. The resulting fabric will be fitted with electrodes at key points to enable us to tap into its electrical potential. We were lucky enough to consult with leaders in the recombinant silk world on our methods of production, especially bolt threads and their spider silk production techniques. Our research suggests that transitioning from E. coli to yeast will allow us to scale up our production and greatly reduce the cost of our product. Once this transition has been made, the process of the production of silk proteins will be very similar to that of beer mated with conventional textile fabrication, presumably with similar costs. Researchers have been successful in manipulating the genetic sequence used in order to change the molecular structure of their silk to develop features that are not present in nature. We believe that we can also use this process to improve the thermoregulatory or thermoelectric properties of the silk. We will distribute our thermoelectrical linings in conjunction with our own polypropylene and steel shelter structures so that the lining and shelter integrate together perfectly. Drawing further inspiration from the hornet's nest, these structures are hexagonal in order to enable higher efficiency, horizontal stacking, and modularity. Our structure will include an integrated electrical system encompassing wiring and lights. It will be built to easily plug in batteries, solar panels, or other components. In the future, the ThermoSilk project can lead in many exciting directions. Although the ideal system is our current design, we also want to make sure that this technology can reach any who need it. To this end, we would like to expand production to linings compatible with many major emergency shelters already in production. Down the line, we would also like to integrate bathroom facilities and water collection systems into the shelter design. On a global scale, we eventually anticipate these shelters to be compatible with different types of climates and lifestyles. At ThermoSilk, we have designed a novel and biodegradable emergency shelter lining that produces electricity while protecting its inhabitants from dangerous heat. We've done it because we believe technology should reflect the changing global landscape and that the best way to evolve is to follow nature. If we have anything to say about it, the emergency shelter and bioenergy sectors will look very different in coming years. of our six finalist videos is from Estonian Academy of Arts, Algae as a Filter. Hello everyone, I would like to introduce you our group project Algae as a Filter from the Estonian Academy of Arts. Our journey in the Biodesign Challenge started with speculation on the topic of increasing weather phenomena in the city of Tallinn. We decided to implement algae in the water filtration system of the city. The journey starts from Tallinn city, which is in Estonia, a small country in the Baltics in the north of Europe. Tallinn is a coastal city of just around 420,000 inhabitants. The geographical position of the city is as beneficial as challenging. On one hand, the western side is in the Baltic Sea, which is so nice to have a year-round access to the water. However, sometimes algae in the sea is blooming, 
and poisoning the whole aquatic system, animals, and also humans. On the eastern side, there is the Ulamista Lake, which supplies the whole city drinking water, but there is no public access to it. Water seems to be under control, and we don't really worry about it. Talina Vesi Company has built a system that pumps water from Ulamista Lake, filtrates it, and delivers it to the people's home. After the water is used, it is then passed to the wastewater treatment plant in Palasara, then released to the Baltic Sea. Talina Vesi Company mentions in the reports sometimes that their system is unable to treat heavy flows of incoming water. Therefore, to avoid major damages, they have to release untreated wastewater into the sea. According to reports, it happened five times in the previous two years alone. During those events, an amount of 80,000 cubic meters of wastewater was discharged into the Baltic Sea. This resulted as algal bloom and the whole aquatic system was endangered. Authorities had to shut down public access to the coastal water and no one was allowed to touch the water. What if extreme downpours due to the climate change will become more and more frequent? What if downpours becomes a new normal? Existing filtration system fails to treat wastewater flows and cause uncontrolled algal bloom. But what is algae blooming? Algae are a natural component of water ecosystem. The algae itself are harmless unless they start to grow uncontrolled. Then, they can have toxic or harmful effects on the marine ecosystem. When some algae bloom or multiply, they can release toxins, especially cyanobacteria. So what happened underwater? Algae thrives in warm, nutrient-rich water. They absorb phosphorus and nitrogen found in the nature to grow. In natural circle, this is good for ecosystem. The algae converts sunlight into carbohydrates. The plankton eats these carbohydrate-rich algae. This plankton is eaten by other fish, and those fish are eaten by larger fish. And so the algae become part of the food chain. But when heat and nutrient are added to the water, the algae have more food than normally available. Therefore, they start to multiply to eat those nutrients. And they grow towards the light. As a result of their weight, they start to sink and then decompose. They extract oxygen from the water to grow, which every other living organism also needs. This process can suffocate entire ecosystems and create dead zones that extend it over 100 kilometers. In addition, some type of algae not only absorb oxygen, but they can also produce toxins. With all of those consequences, this raises a question. What caused algae blooming? Heavy rainfalls wash excess nutrients from the cities, overload sewage systems, and overfiltralize fields into the sea. Count winds allow also algae toxin to accumulate on the surface instead of spreading. With the climate change, the weather is warmer and more frequently which also favors algae blooms. Moreover, deforestation, agriculture, and urbanization exacerbate the problem. Without plants and wetland rooted in the soil, fewer nutrients can be absorbed. But how can we prevent algae bloom? One of the best ways to prevent it is to make sure that the water that is released into the Baltic Sea had been clean and will respect the marine ecosystem. So, we decide to reverse the situation. What if we decide to use algae to solve this problem? If cyanobacteria consumes nitrate, phosphorus, and heavy metals to grow, it is also mean that it could help us clean wastewater. So, our solution is to save the sea from algae blooms with algae. But how would it work? Let us explain here with the scheme. The beginning of our cleaning process is the same for most existing filtration system, the physical part. All of the solid parts that are in the water are taken away. 
Slowly the filters are getting thinner and thinner, so it would leave only liquids or small particles in suspension in water. Then it arrives in a big tank, where some coagulants is added to make sure the separation of the water, oil and sludge, which then can be used for biomass. The water then goes to the algae bath, as we call it. The cyanobacteria loves to eat nitrogen, phosphorus and heavy metals. It helps them grow. The substances are a really good way to feed it outside of the Baltic Sea. After, the water laden from those substances needs to be separated from the algae and then directed to a pond. On the way to the pond, it will be exposed to some UV lights that help photosynthesis and also make sure that other bacteria and or viruses won't follow. After the separation, the algae can be used to also produce biomass or scientific research. Going through pipes, the water goes into the wetland, which increases the water quality. Algae is attached to the roots of the floating island and provides also an habitat for the wildlife. Then it is released to the Baltic Sea, lighted from the pollution that was in it. This is the physical embodiment of the scheme we just described. Aesthetically, it resembles how existing water filtration system looked like, but with added colors, it is more inviting and evokes emotions towards the whole system. But where would it be located? The location is important and need to make sense. We realized that the Pilasara area in the northwest of Tallinn would be ideal. In fact, a wastewater treatment plant already takes place in the middle of this area. It is surrounded by Parasara Nature Reserve and living neighborhoods. In front of the wastewater treatment plant, there is an area with a pond. This is the aerial view of the undeveloped area. We think that is a great potential for placing our solution for multiple reasons. Due to its location close to the city, it already has a public transport facility around and could actually serve people who live and work in this area as a park or recreational area. We want this space to be special for Tallinners. We want them to feel and understand the importance of taking care of our environment by showing and explaining the process of cleaning water and the consequences on the climate change and algae blooming. Overall, this is how our solution looks like. We believe that by introducing more sustainable way to clean wastewater and by letting people appropriate the space and discover what's behind the water they use, we could raise awareness and draw attention to an existing problem of algae bloom and overall climate change. Our reflection and solution is part of the global process of reflection on the climate change. The problem of improper wastewater discharge is worldwide. For example, recently, Swedish media channel made a big investigation on how the Copenhagen wastewater company discharged unfiltered water straight into the sea. If this is happening in one of the most advanced and climate change worried country, we can't even imagine what is happening in the rest of the world. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce keynote speaker, David Benjamin. David is the founder of the Living Architecture Firm and associate professor at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Uh, he's most recently the author of Now We See Now. Uh, David has been working at the intersection of biology, computation, and design for over a decade. And his work has been a huge inspiration for BDC since 
over a decade ago uh, when we started GenSpace. Uh, thank you, David, for joining us. We're really, really pleased to have you uh, speaking this year. Thanks so much. Uh, David, you're muted. Apologies. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. It's really great to be here. Um, thanks for the generous introduction. And I remember back to those first days when uh, I, I took a class of students to GenSpace, and it's really amazing what has happened since then. Um, so I want to um, say that it's really great to be here, and I really admire what all of you are doing. Um, I'm super happy to be able to share a little bit of our latest thinking and some of our recent projects with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the incredible team that I work with. All of our work is very collaborative, and these people shown here individually and collectively bring it to life. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm a professor of architecture and a practicing architect. Here's one of our recent um, completed projects. And I like to start by saying that I believe buildings are living organisms. They breathe and pulse. They inhabit complex ecosystems of species, technologies, and culture. And understanding buildings requires understanding these vital signs and ecosystems. This kind of thinking allows us at our firm to expand the definition of environmental sustainability, and it also allows us to expand our design ecosystems as architects. So along these lines, I'd like to describe our design ecosystem at The Living, my design firm, which includes a variety of interconnected forces and involves a kind of hybrid of the familiar and the new, the ancient and the cutting edge, the technical and the social, the tangible and the atmospheric, the practical and the critical. So it's within this design ecosystem that I'd like to talk about um, a couple of examples of biodesign and our thinking about how biology can play into um, a broader design ecosystem. Um, so we think of our design ecosystem as a, a kind of network of interconnected loops. Um, and within this uh, network, the topic of our work often addresses uh, climate change and our approach, uh, as Dan mentioned, often involves new possibilities at what we think of as the intersection of biology, computation, and design. Of course, as, as you know, you, you're the group that would know this best, architects and designers have been inspired by biology for hundreds of years. But I believe, as you probably also know and believe, that biology of today is different. It's now possible to grow a cell alone on a glass slide instead of inside a living organism. Uh, it's now possible to visualize neurons firing inside of an animal in real time. It's even possible to cut and paste DNA and bring creatures to life that never existed before, such as yeast that produces an anti-malaria medicine. And as of just a few years ago with the demonstration of CRISPR and gene drives, it's now possible to redesign or even eliminate an entire species very quickly, uh, essentially molding evolution itself. Uh, in addition, it's now possible to apply some of the latest techniques of computation, such as computer vision and machine learning, to processes of biological growth. Uh, biological functions involve hundreds of dimensions, but if they can be simulated in a computer model, then they can become a more actionable part of the design process. Yet, the more you learn about biology, uh, at least for me, the more you see how complex biology is and how much we still have to learn about it. Um, and in this sense, I believe that design with biology may involve design with a black box, design with forces beyond our complete control, and design with uncertainty. This new version of biology calls for a new method of design, a new approach, and in the past few years, we've developed three specific ways of thinking about this, three specific approaches to biodesign, and three categories for projects. And I'd like to describe them briefly here. Uh, the first one is biocomputing, which I define as using actual living organisms to process information and solve problems such as perhaps reducing carbon emissions. In an example of, of this uh, approach, 
uh, our firm has been working with Airbus, the big airplane manufacturer, to try to rethink um, the way that airplanes are designed and manufactured. Um, but like many of our projects, we start off with a kind of tangible prototype. In this case, a partition, which is shown in red here, and it's the dividing wall between the seating area and the galley of a plane. And like many uh, components in an airplane, this one has to be certified through pretty intensive testing. Here you can see the so-called 16G crash test of one of the partitions that's flying in today's A320 planes. And you get a sense of how much force uh, this uh, object needs to withstand in a potential impact of an airplane. Um, and although this component uh, looks a little boring, it's kind of forgettable, you've probably seen it several times on a plane and not thought much of it, it's actually a very difficult component to design with traditional engineering approaches, especially if you want to design a lightweight component. And Airbus, in reimagining the future of flight, was thinking about how it could uh, reduce the weight of airplanes, which would reduce uh, fuel consumption and therefore carbon emissions. So we started off trying to design a partition in a lightweight way. Uh, it can only be one inch thick. Uh, it can only attach to the fuselage, the airplane's main structure at two points above and two points below. It has to hold the fold down cabin attendant seat. Um, and it's a difficult component to design in a lightweight way with traditional approaches. And this is where we turned to a living organism. In this case, Physarum, also known as slime mold. Physarum grows in complex networks that are efficient and redundant. They're efficient in that they use a small amount of material to connect the dots. In this case, the dots are sources of food for the Physarum. And it's redundant in that it creates a network where you can remove one of the lines or one of the lines could be damaged and the, the system as a whole, the organism as a whole can still uh, keep all the dots connected more or less. So we used uh, this logic, the logic of slime mold uh, networks to create an algorithm to create uh, potential uh, uh, partition designs where we are connecting the dots of, of what this partition has to do. It has to connect to the uh, points above and below. It has to hold some equipment. Um, and we used a process of artificial evolution to generate, evaluate, and evolve uh, literally thousands of different design options to explore a wide design space as uh, the process of natural evolution, biological evolution itself does. Um, but this, in this case, we're doing it in the computer. So here's a different view of our data set. Each point on the graph is a different design option. We can sort the designs. Uh, according to a kind of color coding, which might be the kind of virtual DNA of the designs, different types of design solutions. We can use algorithms to identify the best set of designs shown here in the black outline. We can graph them uh, according to our goals. In this case, we want to have the lowest possible weight shown on the x-axis and the lowest displacement under structural load shown on the y-axis. We want to be at that zero, zero point of the graph. Um, and there are a number of different ways um, to do this. Uh, a lot of these ways are slightly unusual and beyond a typical engineering approach. And um, just like uh, you know, nature and biology itself, we can run this process um, at a different scale um, to rerun it. So here I'm showing how if on the left we have the problem statement, uh, in the center, we have uh, kind of a first round of artificial evolution, creating this crisscrossing pattern of bars. Then in turn, we can create every single one of those bars out of hundreds of micro lattice bars shown on the right. And to give you a different view of that, instead of using stock material as the bars, we're creating these bars out of micro lattice uh, uh, bars, so uh, kind of a, a smaller scale of bar. Each bar is sized according to the amount of stress that it has in it, um, somewhat like human bone. And like many of our projects, uh, we aim to kind of test some limits of what was possible with the new design approach, but also to make it out in the world. So here you see the 3D printing process we're making uh, what is uh, one of the world's largest metal 3D printed airplane components. And we're doing this 
um, in order to see if this type of approach could create uh, a new airplane component that could fly in today's planes. Um, so here, kind of zooming out, you see uh, the first full-scale uh, component created with this approach. Um, here's a kind of digital simulation of this uh, component and how it's going to perform under something like the 16G test or a kind of static test where uh, you're kind of pulling on the component. And if that was the digital test in the simulation, here is the corresponding physical test. Um, this was just a few months ago, and you can if you look closely in the background, you can see some uh, very uh, excited but nervous Airbus engineers as we're testing the performance of this component, pulling uh, on it with the weight of uh, 24 times uh, the force of gravity to see if this new approach, this new partition can hold together. Um, it did, and in the end, we have created um, a, a, a new airplane component that is about 45% lighter than the traditional component. It's even just a little bit stronger. And the bottom line is that if this component is installed in all of the Airbus A320 planes flying today, this could save about uh, a million tons of carbon emissions per year. So the second approach is called biosensing. Um, which I define as, again, using actual living organisms, not the metaphor of biology, um, but actual living organisms, in this case, to detect and make visible, invisible conditions of the environment. Um, in this example project, in collaboration with some uh, amazing artists and engineers, including Natalie Jeremijenko, um, we have been exploring a public interface to water quality in the East River of New York City. Um, we do this by creating a floating network of lights with uh, sensors below water to detect things like presence of fish and water quality um, and dynamic LED lights above water. Initially, we were using this kind of material, you could call it, these kind of components, uh, digital sensors, electronic circuits. But in a new version of the project, we've been using biological sensors, combining biosensors with digital sensors. And by this, I mean we're using um, actual uh, living mussels, the shellfish. Um, and here you can see a kind of sped up video of the way that mussels open and close their shells a small amount as part of their natural metabolism. They do this to eat and to basically breathe dissolved oxygen underwater. And it turns out that the rate and the amount that mussels open and close their shells is an incredibly sensitive detector of water pollution. So with that in mind, we can take some living mussels attached to one side of the mussel shell, um, an inexpensive magnet, attached to the other side, a Hall effect sensor, which is basically sensing a magnetic field. And for just a couple of dollars, we can have a better tell-all sensor of water pollution and other stress in the water uh, than, say, a $10,000 dissolved oxygen sensor. Um, so this is obviously good for a project budget, but you know, probably more importantly and more profoundly, this suggests a new idea and a new approach, which is to combine artificial intelligence with natural intelligence, to combine uh, artificial intelligence, kind of the best that computation has to offer, the holy grail of AI, with a kind of natural or biological intelligence um, that has kind of been there all along, that in many cases has evolved over millions of years to perform very complex functions, sensing functions, and other kinds of functions. Um, and we can combine them together to get a kind of multiplier effect. So here's one of the early uh, prototypes uh, of our installation, you can see the lights changing color because there's a tipping point in the water quality. The water quality is slightly improving at that point. Um, and uh, this is a, a kind of application of biosensing that we think, again, could be applied to much more than just uh, water quality sensing, but could be a way to use living organisms out in the environment as part of our design palette as designers and architects. So the third and, and final approach that I'll show to round out the three approaches is uh, what I call biofabricating. 
Um, and this is uh, something that I define as using actual living organisms as tiny factor factories, basically, to manufacture renewable building materials. Um, so in this project, which again had a number of amazing collaborators, uh, we started with a kind of thought about the Earth's natural carbon cycle, the endless loop of growth and decay and regrowth. And we had the kind of hypothesis that maybe we could take uh, low value raw materials, basically take waste instead of plants or instead of high value materials, uh, spend a very small amount of energy to convert those raw materials into building blocks, create a useful building, and then at the end of the life of that building, return all of that stuff, all of that physical matter of architecture um, back into the carbon cycle. Um, how could we possibly do this? Seems like a kind of bold idea. Well, again, we turn to a uh, living organism, in this case, mycelium, which you probably already know about. It's the a root-like structure of mushrooms. It grows in these uh, branching patterns. You can see the nutrients um, kind of coursing through these filaments of mycelium. It creates these incredible um, patterns and forms, but we were actually more interested in the function of mycelium than the form, because it turns out you can combine mycelium with agricultural waste, not the high value part of agriculture, such as corn kernels, but corn stover, the low value waste part of agriculture. Combine that with mycelium, put it in a mold of almost any shape, and in just about five days, it grows into a solid object. Um, this is a process that's being explored in, in a number of different ways, including um, by Ecovative, a company that we worked with on this project. Ecovative is making packaging material um, out of uh, mycelium. And our idea a couple of years ago was to create an architectural brick out of this material. Um, and because no one had created um, large scale uh, outdoor uh, architecture out of this material, we had to do a huge amount of testing. We tested um, single bricks, compressing a, a brick to the force of 10,000 pounds, more than it would ever have to resist, um, compressing small assemblies of bricks. And we did this so that in the end, um, we could try to create a full-scale structure out of the material as a test of its viability. So here we are in the courtyard of MoMA PS1, um, creating a structure that will last or that lasted for uh, the summer, as uh, these projects do in the competition for the uh, summer uh, young architects program at PS1. Here you can see us combining into our design ecosystem not only um, some technical performance and some biomaterials and biofabrication, but the expertise of a number of different people and categories of people. So we combined the expertise of Columbia University uh, graduate students in architecture who know a lot about um, form and computation and the expertise of New York City brick masons who know a lot about stacking objects. Neither one alone had ever made something like this before, but together, um, they kind of solved some problems on site to create uh, this experimental uh, structure. Um, here you can see the structure in the context of some of the rest of New York City. So in the background, you have some of the glass and steel skyscrapers of Manhattan. In the foreground, you can see the red clay bricks of MoMA PS1. And our structure was kind of familiar, but also new, um, framing the environment, um, we were experimenting with not only the technical performance of this material, could it be strong enough, could it be weather resistant enough, but also kind of the creative capacity of the material, the atmospheric potential of the material. What would be the qualities of light and shadow on this material? What would it feel like to be inside it? What would it smell like? Um, but of course, the ultimate test of any a MoMA PS1 summer installation is its ability to host a good party. Um, so here is uh, the first Saturday of, of that summer when we installed it, and you can see 5,000 people arriving to hear experimental electronic music. It was a thrilling moment for us to unveil this prototype, but also terrifying as people were um, walking inside our structure, uh, rubbing it, scratching it, climbing it, and uh, when darkness fell, we breathed a sigh of relief. Um, but it was actually uh, very fitting for us to test this idea, this new biofabrication process, this new material, 
out in society, out in culture, more or less in a kind of public space rather than um, only on a lab bench uh, indoors or on the fenced off corner of a construction site. The project also kind of engaged a type of um, dialogue and public reaction through this new kind of short form uh, criticism and discussion. Um, and at the end of the summer, we took the structure apart a little more carefully than you might typically do. We took all of the bricks and crumbled them into smaller pieces. We combined them with yet other living organisms, bacteria and worms in a compost site. And in just about 60 days, all of the physical stuff of that piece of architecture, all of the matter returned to compost, uh, which we in turn used for uh, New York City tree planting and even for community gardens, more or less proving that this is a material that's non-toxic enough to eat. Um, one of the bigger ideas of the project is that maybe as designers and architects, we can think about designing to disappear as much as we normally think about designing to appear. Um, and so if I've kind of tried to paint a picture of three different approaches we've been exploring and shown some example projects of the kind of hands-on prototypes we make in each approach, um, it's important to note that these projects are very open-ended. They're not um, ends in themselves. In a way, they're never finished. Instead, each project potentially generates new questions and new possibilities. And with some of these questions and possibilities, they can grow into new projects. I want to show one example of that now. Um, and explain how with our project Hi-Fi, which I just showed, the installation for PS1, our bricks were alive during their formation, um, but then they became dead, inert, and predictable when we dried them out, and they became uh, more or less like other building materials during construction and occupation. But we always had this question, what if the bricks were not dried out, and if the material did not become dead and inert? What if building materials could be literally alive? Would they have some of the same properties of living organisms like self-healing and self-attaching and growing? And this is uh, an idea and some questions that we wanted to experiment with. And we found the opportunity in a new installation uh, a few months ago at the Pompidou Center in Paris. Um, so we started experimenting with growing new units of material and placing them next to each other when they were still growing and alive. Uh, this was our kind of hypothesis, and we quickly saw that we were able to achieve what we call bio-welding. Um, basically, the living units fuse together, they grow together, and we have, in essence, brick and mortar in the same object. So here in this time lapse, over a couple of days, you can get a sense of how it works. These objects that are sitting next to each other grow into each other and create one bigger object. And this gave us many ideas for architectural experiments. I'll show a couple of them here. Um, we first looked at combining bio-welding with the process that we call voxel 3D printing. This basically means stacking small objects, small cubes or spheres, in a way that's programmed to create an object that consists of hundreds or thousands of units. Um, but the key for us here is that we were not just stacking um, inert objects. We were um, stacking some living objects and some non-living objects. And the key was that we had two different types of units, mycelium units and wood units, which created three different types of adjacencies. So we had mycelium to mycelium, which would bio-weld together. We had mycelium next to wood, which would also bio-weld. Um, but we had wood next to wood, which would not bio-weld. And this gave us a way to program the arrangement of different spheres um, in a way that it would grow into an object of a form that we were interested in. So here you see after we've, um, you know, had the bio-welding occur, had certain objects stick to each other, other objects not stick to each other, we pull out all the ones that don't stick to each other, and we have, a, you know, a new type of form that could be considered a, a prototype for architecture with the mycelium units on the outside, wood units on the inside, and we get a small scale version of what could potentially be used um, to create things like shelters. Um, in the next line of research, we were interested in again using bio-welding, but this time combining it with what's called material jamming. So jamming is a material effect that occurs when units are poured on top of one another. 
Um, so consider grains of sand as a unit. If they're poured out of each other and the grains are spherical, it's going to create a pretty flat mound. If the grains are more angular, it'll create a slightly steeper mound. And if the grains have a kind of forked shape, um, then you could create even steeper mounds and, and almost like a vertical wall, potentially. Um, then you can combine uh, jamming with a formwork. And this is something that's been studied in different applications, including um, funnels. Um, so in something like a grain silo where you have a funnel, there's a lot of research on how to avoid jamming. You don't want the objects to kind of clog together and create a, you know, a sticking point. But we were interested almost in reversing the, the idea. What if you deliberately created something like a clog in something like a silo or a different shape of a, of a formwork? Could we create um, a more or less poured version of architecture through jamming and then bio-welding? So you see some uh, tests at different scales in those prototypes in that video. Uh, we used those tests to develop a kind of rough idea of a design we were interested in. We couldn't um, ensure exactly what it was going to look like, but we set up the process and the rules to try to create a new, uh, you know, more or less architecture scale prototype inside the Pompidou Center in Paris. So this will just show a few of the quick steps. Here we're again growing mycelium blocks. Uh, we're using simple buckets as the formwork. Um, and we're going to grow them in two separate phases. The first phase allows the units to kind of solidify into their shape. So it goes from a loose material of mycelium and agricultural waste into a kind of solid object. But then there's a second phase of growing when the objects are next to each other. Um, and meanwhile, we take those objects and rather than stacking them one by one, like typical brick stacking, we pour them into a kind of formwork with very specific dimensions and properties. Here you can see us building the formwork. It's more or less scaling up from what was shown in the previous uh, clip of the prototypes. Here you see the units inside of the formwork. Um, and then we um, critically uh, remove more or less the plug at the bottom of the funnel. So if you think of that box as a kind of funnel, we remove the bottom. Um, luckily, there's some jamming, which means the objects aren't just uh, pouring and flowing out of the bottom of the plug. Uh, we remove the looser objects, um, but the, there is a kind of self-organized form of an arch um, of the objects that are um, jammed in more together. Um, this follows the line of force. Um, and then we uh, allow the objects to grow together. So the first process is jamming. That creates a kind of void at the bottom and an arch shape. The second process is bio-welding over five days. And here you can see then when we remove the entire formwork, we have a somewhat self-organized construction of a physical arch made from jamming and bio-welding. Okay, so um, finally, I want to wrap up and, and just say if those first three approaches sometimes generate a kind of spin-off project, um, sometimes just thinking uh, about this domain of biodesign or, or really any domain in a design ecosystem um, can lead to kind of new veins of research. And I want to show the last uh, project as a new vein of research that we've explored recently. Um, so this is a, a project that's still in progress. It involves um, some ideas about ecosystems, architecture, and public health. It's a collaboration with two good friends and colleagues uh, of mine, uh, Kevin Slavin and Elizabeth Henna. And it builds off some amazing work that they and others have done at the intersection of biology and cities. Um, so this may be a little bit familiar to you, um, but we started with the hypothesis that just as we are increasingly aware of the bacteria in our own bodies and the way a gut microbiome contributes to individual health, we might also start paying attention to the bacteria in our cities and the way an urban microbiome contributes to collective health. In other words, microbes are all around us, even though they're invisible, they're in the air, on our food, inside our architecture, on our architectural materials. And contrary to 20th century thinking that microbes equal disease, and therefore we should aim to make our environment sterile, we now know that most microbes, including, I should say, most viruses, actually help keep us alive. So in this context, for an installation at Storefront for Art and Architecture, 
we set out to explore two things, maps and models. For maps, we were measuring the microbiome at a gallery in Soho and comparing it to the microbiomes of other places in the city. And for models, we were exploring design scenarios for architecture that promotes microbes. And we're thinking about whether there could be something like probiotic architecture, which might improve public health. To do this, we developed a specific bioreceptive bio material that was kind of designed to uh, catch and host microbes. And more specifically, we started with wood. Wood is pretty well suited to hosting microbial life based on its molecular composition and its micro and macro shapes. And at the storefront gallery space, we transformed the facade, the panels of the facade, with wood tiles cut from standard lumber and then deliberately eroded through a sandblasting process to create um, diverse microclimates. Each mic microclimate had distinct grain and knots of the wood. You can see a few of them here um, that would create different pockets of shade and moisture, different kind of conditions for microbes to grow. And this allowed us to see that even some of the most common and humble uh, building materials, like a cheap four by four post of Douglas fir, you know, a forgettable piece of lumber at a lumber store, um, even that object has a material story that could be uncovered and that might offer a range of visible and invisible effects. So in terms of the physical materials, um, with a building envelope, as you see in the background there, uh, made of a bioreceptive wood, architecture can become a kind of sensor for the urban microbiome. And for the second part of the project, in terms of living materials, we set up uh, basically a small bio lab inside the gallery in order to sequence DNA on site to see what was going on. Um, I'll describe this very quickly. I'll be done in one minute. Um, so here are the basic steps. Uh, first, swab sandblasted tiles from each location to collect the surface microbes. Then place the swab in a liquid solution and agitate it to break down the cell walls. Then separate the DNA from other substances. Add marker beads to the DNA fragments and produce uh, a pure DNA solution. Load the DNA solution onto a flow cell uh, to be processed by a portable DNA sequencer. This can basically just be plugged right into a laptop through the USB port. And the sequencer converts electrical charge from the flow cell into sequence data, the A, T, C, and G of genetic code. So finally, after we sequence the DNA from each location, the gallery in Soho and some other locations around the city, we designed a system to automatically draw the output as an early and very rough map to an uncharted territory, what's going on in the invisible microbial world in our urban environment. So this map is raw and it's at a coarse resolution, but it's already allowed us to see some interesting things. For example, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, we saw microbial DNA that performs the function of breaking down heavy metals, which basically indicated that the Navy Yard had specific pollutants that were not found in Soho. And so basically what this project has done is allowed us to use a gallery as an urban space um, that we're converting into an active living experiment, architecture as a living experiment. We're exploring a new type of architectural facade as a new way of seeing some of the important matter and organisms that help keep us alive. We're looking at materials and their layers of living matter, such as invisible microbes, we're reframing buildings as stewards for the urban microbiome. And the initial evidence indicates that our collective future, the future of all humans plus all non-human animals and all microbes is probably a lot more collective than any of us can see or imagine. Thank you. All right, thank you, David. That was phenomenal. Um, Okay, you, you're welcome um, to turn up your camera. Next up, we'd like to welcome science fiction writer, Annalie Newitz. Annalie is the author of the book, Autonomous, a winner of the Lambda Literary Award. Check out their book, Four Lost Cities, which is coming out in just a few weeks. Annalie is a co-host of the Hugo Award-winning podcast, Our Opinions Are Correct. They are the founder of the blog, io9, as well as the former editor-in-chief of Gizmodo. Annalie will be speaking to Tori Bosch, the editor of Future Tense, a joint collaboration between Neo America, Slate Magazine, and Arizona State University. 
Tori co-edited Future Tense Fiction, Stories of Tomorrow, which features Annalise's short story, When Robot and Crow Saved East St. Louis. I love that short story. Thank you, both of you, uh, Annalie and Tori, for joining us today. Uh, you can turn on your cameras and please begin. And make sure you unmute, yes. Thank you so much, Vina. And hey, Annalie, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good. I'm so excited for us to be here today among all of these brilliant young students. So um, everybody, congratulations on your projects and on making it this far. Um, I think that we are the ones standing between the students and finding out who won. So we will make this as exciting a conversation as we can, <laughs> knowing that um, you were hoping that our time passes very quickly. Um, so, Annalie, to start, um, like a lot of the students in the Biodesign Challenge, you actually don't have a hard science educational background to start with. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about how you became a science fiction author? Sure. Um, it is a long and winding path that involved a lot of academia. So um, I started out studying basically humanities and social science when I got my PhD at Berkeley. Um, and I did a very interdisciplinary dissertation where I was looking at um, sort of images of science in pop culture and how the public understood those images in the context of various social uh, movements. And um, I mean, basically it was just about monster movies, but there was this framework around it. Um, and when I left grad school, um, I uh, became very interested in writing about science and technology in the real world. And I went to MIT to do um, a science journalism fellowship through the Knight program, um, which is associated with their STS department and um, a lot of other projects at MIT where they bring together people from humanities and social sciences and the sciences. Um, and I did that because I wanted to get a really good science education. I wanted to get it in the context of how I could um, talk about culture and society and the way technology impacts that um, and science. And I was particularly interested in bioscience. Um, and so I had a lot of uh, background with tech um, and I, I just wanted to learn about the technology of our bodies and our relationship to the environment. And so I have worked my entire adult life as a science journalist and a technology journalist. So uh, basically it's kind of cheating uh, if you wanna be a science fiction writer, if you surround yourself with fascinating people who are doing cutting edge scientific work um, basically, I spent, you know, 10 years just storing up cool shit in my head, um, including uh, work like the stuff that David Benjamin is doing um, at The Living. I've been following his work for a really long time. Um, and in fact, if you read Autonomous, there's definitely stuff that I stole from his brain uh, in there um, because it's a future where bio design is the norm. And people are using things like, uh, they're using foamers to make sidewalks. You have biodegradable sidewalks, biodegradable roads. Um, you have homes that are made of living materials, uh, sensors that are made of living materials. I love all that stuff. And it shows up in my science fiction all the time. So for me, the pathway really was sort of through a weird, it was a, a weird pathway that overlapped with humanities, with um, social science and science. Um, and I think, that you know, there's no um, there's there's no real hard boundary between science and the humanities. Like we pretend there is because we we want to believe that um, because we want to make academic departments um, that are kind of balkanized. But the fact is that um, science fiction and a lot of cultural work around science are part of the scientific project, um, and architecture can be part of the scientific project too. And so that's what really excites me is like being at that kind of space in between uh, many disciplines and telling stories about where that might take us as a civilization or as civilizations, I should say. There's not just one. <laughs> well, um, so I'm glad you mentioned Autonomous because I think that we will talk a fair bit about Autonomous and uh, When Robot and Crow Saved East St. Louis, which I was thrilled to publish on Slate. Um, yeah, so thank maybe you. Could could you give us a really brief rundown of what each of those stories are? Sure. Um, so Autonomous is the story of a pharmaceutical pirate, and she's living about 150 years from now in a world where um, a lot of things are better than, than or better in the sense for the environment uh, than they are now. Um, as I said, bio 
uh, biodesign is kind of the norm. Um, sustainable energy is the norm. Um, a lot of the problems that we're facing now around toxins in the environment are not completely solved, but they're, um, they're being remediated uh, on a wide scale globally. But um, the world that Jack, my pirate, lives in, because of course she's named Jack, she's a pirate, um, you know, it's a, it's a world of hyper-capitalism. And one of the things I wanted to really emphasize with her character, who has started as a synthetic biologist, she wants to bring medicine to everyone. Uh, she comes from um, a rural farming community, so she is very interested in helping people who aren't um, fancy rich people in the cities. Uh, and corporations just own everything. And the more that um, people have begun building with life forms, and the more that life forms have become something that we can manufacture, uh, the more that capitalism has stretched out its tentacles to own those things. And so it's a world where essentially slavery has been reinvented under a very sanitized system, which they refer to as indenture. Um, and it's, it's also governments around the world refer to it as a kind of uh, worker freedom because you are free to sell your labor on the free market and getting indentured is great because your company uh, feeds you and they put you up and what a good deal, right? Uh, just 10 years, man. Um, and then you're free. So um, it, I wanted to kind of show that, um, you know, when we make uh, strides forward in our um, discovery of how to use sustainable materials and things like that, uh, we don't always fix all our problems. In fact, we can exacerbate uh, social problems. And so Jack becomes a pirate because she realizes the only way to get expensive drugs to people who don't have a lot of money um, is to steal. And so she reverse engineers a lot of the drugs that corporations are making available and either gives them away for free uh, or sells them for cheap. Um, and of course, it's a novel, right? So it's not just me sort of pontificating about like capitalism. Um, so she uh, infringes on a patent for a drug that pisses off a corporation and they dispatch um, a very gender confused robot um, and her companion to her human companion to track Jack down. So it's a chase story. Um, a lot of it has to do with the nature of being alive. And uh, much of the book is from the point of view of the robot named Paladin, because Paladins are awesome. Um, uh, Paladin is chasing Jack down. And so as Jack is figuring out more about this inequality in the world, uh, Paladin is also, and of course Paladin is owned by a corporation. So Paladin has to figure out what it means to be a life form that is also a commodity. Um, so, it's, it's a fun book with chasing and robot sex, but it's also really about um, thinking about how just because you can build a building out of mycelium, which is so freaking badass and such a, a wonderful vision of the future, that doesn't mean you're going to eliminate all of the problems we see with corporate ownership and corporate abuse. Uh, and then can you give us a very quick praises of when Robot and Crow saved East St. Louis? Sure. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is a story with a talking crow, which is like one of my favorite things in the universe. Um, so basically, it's said in the near future, I wrote it a couple of years ago, um, and it's about a pandemic, um, or it's not a pandemic, it's an epidemic uh, breaking out in East St. Louis um, in Southern Illinois. And uh, the CDC sends out um, drones to do basically health surveillance and um, uh, checking on, um, you know, who, who might be sick um, and contact tracing and things like that. And so these drones are designed to be very cute. And I thought a lot about um, uh, user experience design when I was doing it, because I was like, how would you make a drone that people would want to give spit samples to or blood samples to? It would have to be freaking insanely cute. It would have to be Wally. -E. So basically, it's an, it's a super, super cute drone. Um, and its main superpower, other than taking saliva samples and other kinds of samples, um, is that it can very quickly, thanks to its programmer, uh, learn different languages and um, learn uh, sociolects. And so it addresses people in the language that they're most comfortable with, whether, like I said, that's a sociolect or a dialect or another language. Um, and East St. Louis is incredibly multicultural. Um, and so that's really required. Uh, and unfortunately, the CDC is shut down due to lack of funding. 
So Drone, the character robot, um, is on their own. And they wind up learning to speak crow language and communicating with the crows in East St. Louis. And the crows actually identify an outbreak in progress because they figure out that people are getting sick and dying. And the crows, why do they care? They don't really like people, but they really like our garbage. And so they're willing to kind of pitch in and help a little bit because we're part of their ecosystem, right? We're producing the, the waste that they love. So, um, so anyway, Crow and, and Robot uh, work with a cute kid um, to help stop this um, outbreak uh, with the help of a uh, makerspace that is in the town because there is no government help at this point. It's a little bit on the nose, even though I wrote it a couple of years ago. It's just sort of like the government says, screw it, we don't, there's nothing we can do. Um, so they rely on this local nonprofit that can help them manufacture a just-in-time vaccine. Um, and I based it on my experiences going to tons of amazing maker spaces and some um, biohacker spaces. Uh, and that's a big part of my work. I spend a lot of time talking to hackers and makers about what's possible. And so there's pretty much in every one of my novels and in many of my short stories, there's like little moments in, in hacker spaces or on university campuses where people are sort of effectively setting up these kinds of spaces. So um, I don't forget where I come from. <laughs> there's, there's always some academics in there doing good. Yeah, I mean, one of, some of my favorite parts of your, your work are, are the sort of joy of creation, of uh, sort of reflecting on how fun it is to just create things that haven't been done before and the camaraderie, the concept, um, and also just sort of the sense of playfulness and joy that comes in even the darkest stories. I mean, in some ways, parts of Autonomous and Robot and Crow are both, you know, pretty depressing, but I came away from reading both of them, both when they were first published and again this week preparing for this conversation, um, with just sort of a sense of optimism and the reminder that the future will have moments that are wonderful even when things are scary. So could you maybe talk a little bit about how you work that sense of sort of delight into, into sometimes slightly dark settings? Well, I am easily delighted. <laughs> so, um, and I do take a lot of hope from the real world. A lot of the um, uh, work that I did in Autonomous and a lot of my other stories um, came out of uh, following iGEM, which is another um, very similar to the biodesign contest where students uh, invent biotech, um, usually with a, an eye toward um, some kind of environmental uh, remediation. And I also really believe that part of the role of science fiction is to get us thinking about, um, you know, it's, it's thought experiments, get us thinking about where we want what we're building in the labs um, to take us. And dystopian science fiction, we all know exactly why that's there. We've all, a lot of us have read 1984 or The Handmaid's Tale. These classic works of dystopia are signposts saying, don't go here. Just like see all of these trends that are happening right now. Like the, this is where they will lead. This is terrifying. Don't do that. We need to stop. Um, but we also need the other side of that, right? We need stories about, okay, well, once we stopped The Handmaid's Tale, well, where do we go? And so I don't, I don't believe in utopia. Like I don't write anything where stuff is perfect. As I just mentioned, like, you know, we get our perfect ecotopia future, but then there's slavery. So um, there's there's never a happy, perfect ending. Uh, but I do think that um, even writing a story where there are progressive uh, changes in culture, even though there's, you know, drawbacks, um, feels utopian at this point, especially right now. And so I really do make a conscious effort to focus on characters who are trying to fix things. Um, you know, people who become pirates when they realize that they can't work within the system or uh, people who become um, subversives because they realize that their environmental work is actually connected to a larger colonial project, which is part of what I'm working on right now in a novel. Um, and I think, in a sense, I try to keep realism in there because um, in, instead of just taking you into a perfect utopia where we're all like blissed out and everything is perfect, because... I do want it to be a roadmap. I want people to understand, like, even if you come up with a solution, you're just going to create more problems that you'll have to grapple with down the road. Um, but 
I, I focus on characters fixing things. I focus on characters forming alliances and friendships, even if it's non-human characters, um, which happens quite often in my work these days. And I really want people to come away from my work feeling like there actually is something they can do, even in really dark times. And I think, you know, we're living through an incredibly great example of that happening in real life, where we've had a lot of adversity. Um, there's been so much um, reactionary uh, cultural, let's just say, we've had a lot of reactionary cultural moments, uh, both in the United States and across the world with the rise of, of populism and um, authoritarianism. And yet we've also seen, at least in the United States right now, we're seeing some of the most hopeful forms of uprising that I've ever seen in my life. I've, I've never seen so much, um, you know, hope and people putting their lives on the line to show that they want a better world. They want a better world for uh, people who've been marginalized and for people who've been victimized. And so even in dark times, things like Black Lives Matter can happen. And that's part of what I want people to remember because it's sometimes hard. It's sometimes it's very easy to go down the dystopian route. It's really satisfying because when you hate what's happening in your world, you want to burn it all down. Totally understandable. Um, but if you burn it all down, you wind up with just ashes. And so I really I want us to try to think together, um, whether through fiction or nonfiction or through building freaking awesome buildings. Um, about how we can actually walk through this thorny path and like maybe make it to a place where things are are better for everyone and there's justice as well as super badass buildings. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I love about your work is that you're creating futures that I can imagine myself living in. You know, it's hard to imagine living in a dystopia because it doesn't feel sort of human somehow, but I can um, I can see myself in autonomous in 150 years. I hope we're all there, except yes. without the slavery. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I would prefer not or, or the corporate control, but yeah, the, the advances in uh, biomaterials and pharmaceuticals would be, be fantastic for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you talked about alliances in your stories. And one thing I, I think we've all been thinking about a lot is sort of the challenge of competing for different types of justice and times when it feels like things can be at cross purposes. So in Autonomous, there's a couple of different major veins. There's the fight for equitable access to healthcare for everybody. And then there's the fight for autonomy for um, for every sentient creature, be they human or machine or something altogether different. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, there's a tension there. Um, I think also we're seeing a similar tension right now with both the pandemic and this new renewed struggle for civil rights happening right now. Can you talk a little bit about competing areas of activism and how they can work together in your stories and in real life? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I, in Autonomous um, and also in Robot and Crow, in a lot of my books, I have characters who are trying to change the world for the better, who are, for lack of a better term, just clueless about the larger context of how injustice is happening, or they're just clueless about other kinds of injustice. So my pharmaceutical pirate, Jack, um, she really understands how intellectual property law deprives people of health care. And it's, uh, you know, it's something that's a life or death issue. It's not theoretical. Um, she's seen people that she loves die. And she wants to stop that. At the same time, she grew up enfranchised. She's never known anyone really who became indentured. She has kind of vague memories of, of growing up in Saskatchewan where lots of indigenous kids became indentured, but she didn't really think about it. She just sort of was like, oh, well, that's just normal. Um, and eventually she meets someone who grew up indentured and that person is like, hey, you know, Patents are bad, but you know what's really bad? It's really bad when you're a living being who's owned, not just a medicine that's owned. And it really changes Jack's perspective, and it actually causes her to clean up her act a little bit. Um, and one of the things I like to think about is how do these kinds of, um, in our real world, how do these different kinds of movements talk to each other? Because we do have movements around civil rights, 
um, gaining more rights for people who have traditionally been uh, oppressed and locked out of many of our powerful institutions. Uh, but then we also at the same time have the struggle for things like uh, improving the environment or uh, improving access to um, property, intellectual property, uh, things that, um, or, or scientific, you know, movements to make uh, scientific research more open. Um, and these things can sometimes feel really removed from each other. If you're marching in the streets for Black Lives Matter, um, that feels really immediate and human, whereas, um, you know, arguing in a boardroom that we have to be careful with biased algorithms in our artificial intelligence or in our machine learning um, feels really kind of like, how is that really doing anything? Like, um, how is that, uh, you know, how are these the same struggle? Um, but they are. Um, they're very much connected because it's all about self-determination and living in balance with each other and living in balance with the environment and all of that stuff can come together. Um, there's a great uh, documentary that just came out called Coded Bias that does a fantastic job thinking about the connection between um, developing algorithms you know, in the lab and how that's connected immediately to social justice issues around race and gender. Um, and I, I think it's just, I think, I guess what I would say is that it's an ongoing struggle to try to bring things together like that. Like we all, many of us are fighting for justice in very different rooms and we often forget to listen to each other. And this is also a lesson that goes back to what we started with, with um, interdisciplinary scholarship and inter interdisciplinary work where we have this idea that like science is here, technology is here, culture and society are over here. And like, you just can separate them out and they can just go along their way and they have nothing to do with each other at all. When in fact, they're deeply connected and they're always changing each other. And if you walk into a living building, which I really hope we will one day, um, that's gonna change your understanding of nature. It's gonna change your understanding of your relationship to other people. Um, it's not gonna be just a technical achievement. It's gonna be a lot more than that. And I think that as we, um, you know, as you guys look to the future of where your technologies will go and where your ideas about how to play with biology and novel materials go, I mean, it's always important to think about them as embedded in cultural relationships. And having looked at some of the projects that have come out of this biodesign challenge, I can see people are already doing that. They're thinking about face masks and homeless shelters and how to, you know, um, design filters so that a place like Flint, Michigan never happens again. Um, and or what happened with their water. Flint, Flint can stay. We just don't want the lead in the water. <laughs> um, and uh, and so I think that's that's part of that's part of storytelling, but that's also part of inventing real life objects. Uh, we only have a couple more minutes, so um, I have two final questions for you real quick. Sure. Um, I mean, the first is, can you maybe talk a little bit about sort of longer term thinking and innovation versus shorter term thinking and innovation? Do people have to decide to focus on one at the expense of the other? Definitely not. And I think, again, this this is sort of picking up the thread of imagining your work in the context of society or in the context of culture. Um, you have to imagine your work in the context of the next five years, but also the next hundred years or the next thousand years, especially if you're interacting with the environment. Because as we know, carbon cycles are long. And what we do on the earth now will be affecting people in a thousand years. Um, when I first started covering climate science, um, I talked to uh, a geologist who studies um, three million, three billion year old rocks. So he's he's really focused on the three billion year ago uh, phase. And we were talking about carbon cycling and how the earth has been through lots of phases of high carbon. And I said, so what are we looking at now? Like with with how we've perturbed the carbon cycle as as humans, um, you know, what's the you know what's the outcome? And he just he gave me this sad stare, and he said oh yeah, things are gonna be messed up for at least a thousand years. Just, you know, bottom line. Um, so we have to be thinking about that and telling ourselves stories about how our work might impact people in a thousand years, while at the same time remembering you have to survive, you have to make a living, you have to build things now for people around you now. Um, 
But I do think that storytelling, um, whether you're telling the story or you're reading other people's stories, really helps with that. It really helps to empathize with people in the future. Uh, it's a big part of my science fiction. Um, I'm working on a, an epic now about terraforming that's a multi-generational epic about people who are changing their environment, but trying to keep the carbon cycle balanced and trying to keep the environment um, diverse and keep the human footprint small. And, um, and it really helps me just to be able to say like, well, and then a thousand years later, this happened. Um, and so while we can't ever experience that realistically until we have time travel or infinite life, um, we, can, we can think about it logically through stories. I cannot wait to read the new novel. I can't wait um, to be done. <laughs> <laughs> Would you just hurry up, Emily? I know. Uh, <laughs> all right, my last question before we wrap up. Um, so, you know, one thing we see in Autonomous that feels really relevant to the biodesign challenge is that um, Jack is faced with, she has this, this wonderful idealism and she gets a little bit frustrated with her peers when they leave college as you know people start to sort of make um allowances or you know work with the system that she fought against so hard and could you talk a little bit about how as our students are leaving um the university how they can sort of retain that sense of idealism in, their, in themselves and still make things happen you have about 45 seconds to, to great um to okay yeah. so edibles okay sorry um, <laughs> Um, I think, I mean, again, it's it's hard because as soon as you hit your head up against the real world, like you realize like, oh, everything takes way longer to change. Um, we, are, we actually are looking at a thousand years, not 10 minutes. Um, but I think the best way to do it is to constantly be talking to people outside your narrow discipline. Um, for me, that's always the thing that's reawakened my enthusiasm about the future and my sense of possibility. So if you're working on mushrooms, talk to somebody who works on bacteria. If you're working on bacteria, talk to somebody who works on trees. Um, you know, or if you're working on architecture, talk to somebody who writes books or talk to somebody who does public transit. Um, you know, it's really important for us to be thinking about the big picture, especially with design, because you're talking about um, creating, creating objects, creating buildings, creating technologies that many, many, many people will use. You have an audience in the same way that, um, you know, celebrities have audiences, people who make objects that we use every day, like phones or um, doorknobs or like just really badass doors. Um, I do a lot of walking around my neighborhood right now, so I'm, I'm really appreciating doors as like an interface. Um, because they really are, you're, you're interacting with so many people. And so it's important to remember who all those people are and how they might be using your shit in ways that you didn't expect. Um, you know, when people adopt technologies, I mean, look, all I could think of when I was getting excited about mycelium bricks was like, and it'll be used for porn. Like, and it'll be used for all kinds of activities that we didn't expect. You know, it's like, yes, of course it will be amazing for bricks, but what else will people do with it? Um, I'm sorry to pick on the mycelial bricks, but I'm just like, they're so rad. They're so cool. Um, I, want, I want a house made of them. Um, and so I think, again, storytelling is helpful for that, but also talking. Um, I really believe that the smallest unit of hope is friendship and allyship. And so just making sure that you're like, if you're getting way too deep into pessimism and dystopia, just talk to someone who's an expert on something else and get them to just tell you a freaking cool story about something that they discovered or that they know about. And it might give you just a tiny, tiny bit of hope. I'm writing down the smallest element of hope is friendship because that's just so, so, so beautiful. It's true. I mean, yeah. it's always, for me, it's always been the thing that's been the saving grace. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I could keep talking to you for about an hour, but I think the students want to take their break and then find out who won. So I want to know who won so too. It was I'm so awesome. You guys rock. So go out there and make the world more awesome and more biotechnological instead of just like what it is now. Thank you, Biodesign Challenge. Thank you, Annalie and Tori. Yeah, that was wonderful. I think we we tell our students to really think about context often, right? And working across disciplines. And uh, it was it's so validating to hear 
people that are, you know, in, in the world doing it right now talk about it as well. And great pieces of advice as well. So thank you again. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break. Uh, we're going to air a few videos for you all to see. So over the past few days of the Biodesign Challenge Summit, we've we've compi we compiled uh, several videos from professionals in our field, uh, several of the BDC alumni and some of our sponsors. Um, uh, videos from from all of these individuals to to kind of um, entertain you all. So um, we'll see you all in about fifteen minutes. Thank you. In this place, the warmth from the sun makes the smells of honey and soil melt together. A sugared veil floats over the landscape. The sun distributes itself to tall, velvety plants, to soil, to insects, all weaving into shapes and colours, as if showing the sun what its photons have become. Here, honeybees feed on nectar from the bright white mycelium growing from blackened, rotting wood and as thin threads reaching through the soil. Crawling through the underworld, the mycelial webs preach a re-meditative approach, a slow science for earthly living, being, thinking and doing. We told the bees, we told them how their keepers' lives were changing. While feeding them mycelium nectar, we prayed for them to stay. With spores we shrouded the soil, heavy with stories and oil, to nourish and heal the ravaged lands. Our faith inoculated action. Converting the keepers and shrouding the soil revealed to the bees a future worth remaining for. This was our response as we awaited theirs. designing the future of food for over 30 years. Good. This laboratory, the first of its kind, is where biologists and artists work together tackling some of the world's biggest biological concerns. Over the years, we've spawned some unique results, but nothing as successful, impactful, and delicious as this. Meet the Mayo Tomato, the amazing protein-packed fruit that started it all. A biological breakthrough that changed the way we think about protein. I have something amazing to show you. Randy, get the, um, get the, get the thing. As you wish. Before the Mayo Tomato, humans relied heavily on animals for their daily source of protein. With a growing global population and a strained agricultural system, we recognized animal protein was not an ecologically sustainable source. There had to be an alternative method. We put together some of the brightest scientific and artistic minds we could find, and the result was impressive. Take a look. This will layer it a little bit, JK. <laughs> In 2016, the BioArt team at the School of Visual Arts engineered the world's first fruit to produce the same protein, myoglobin, found in animals, the myotomato. They found plants to be deficient in megadoses of protein necessary for a nutritional human diet. So they translated a DNA sequence found in beef and inserted it into a tomato's genome. The result? One little tomato possessed the same amount of protein found in an 8-ounce steak. This breakthrough creation caused quite the stir. 
It seems not everyone was a fan of this amazing scientific achievement. GMOs are dumb and stupid and poison. Of course we're not happy. However, in the year 2030, mad cow disease almost completely wiped out the cattle industry, creating an urgent need for the Mayo Tomato's amazing protein power. And soon, hearts, minds, and mouths were open. The Mayo Tomato ushered in a global movement that ultimately ended our need for animal consumption. Not bad for a group of art students, if you ask me. I'm Rowan Willow. I'm the lead scientist here at BioShield. For a while now, we've been studying your tears. It turns out the tears of people with ovulatory cycles contain chemo signals that reduce testosterone and make it harder for those around you to tell that you're ovulating. Testosterone is linked to heightened libido and, in some cases, aggression. We've been hard at work in the lab crying and collecting data. We've taken this data and we're proud to introduce our new product, the BioShield Tear Collector. Collected tears, collected voices, collective action. It's an all-in-one covert collector that allows you to harvest your own chemo signals. When you sense a threat, you can just pop open the ring and let the chemo signals do the talking. This product can be used to lower occurrences of microaggressions and work as a biochemical shield against unwanted sexual attention. This ring is not meant to prevent any threat not associated explicitly with testosterone. While the ring may help diffuse the situation or reduce microaggressions, we do not recommend this ring in more serious cases of sexual aggression. When using the ring, make sure to open it fully and within swelling distance of your intended target. We cannot ensure any outcome. All bodies are chemically different and we cannot guarantee your mixture of chemo signals are the same as others. Hormonal medication may affect your production of tears and chemo signals. Side effects of crying include stress and mood, dehydration, and nausea. Ask a therapist today and see if crying is right for you. BioShield. Because while we're waiting for social and legislative change, sometimes all we have is our tears. Live from New York, where the world's first Cas9 opened earlier today despite ongoing protests. The public backlash first started in 2051 when the Universal Genetic Screening Law was passed, requiring preventable genetic disorders to be removed from embryos in order for them to qualify for universal free health care. Since then, scientists and doctors have been inching closer to creating fully designed humans, what the public refers to as designer babies. The law states that parents are not allowed to handpick desired genes for their offspring, but Cas9 puts chance back into the equation. We spoke earlier to Cas9's first family unit to hear a little bit more about how it works. All of our genes are in our 23 pairs of chromosomes, but to Cas9, our chromosomes will be copied and stored in the gene bank so they can later be recombined and synthesized to form the genome of a new baby. We play around with Bebe Roulet for each chromosome. 
The wheel ensures a randomized selection, but players can increase their odds by betting extra chips. And what if you don't like a certain gene on a chromosome assigned to your baby? Crisp the tokens, just crisp them right out. This is Brianna, one of our parents playing at the cast night tonight. I'm Brianna, daughter of the president and CEO of the gene bank in the cast night. I'm paying for us to have this baby. And I feel so blessed that the government has given us access to this sort of technology. It's a really great option for people like me. Yes, it's expensive. Not everyone can afford it. But what I can't afford is to have a baby that's just average. I feel lucky to be chosen to be part of this group. I grew up before humans were screened for genetic diseases, and I've had really crippling medical bills because of it. So I know I can't afford my own baby, but Brianna hired me as the primary caretaker and genetic parent of our baby because I have blue eyes. So I guess I got lucky after all. This is truly an amazing step in the scientific community. Genetic regulations have hindered mankind to push the limits of the human race, but Cas9 is a step in the right direction. Why should we keep settling for natural selection when we can select whatever we want? Now let's check in to see how the game is going. All righty, chromosome 9. Chromosome 9 may determine your child's eyebrow thickness, forehead freckles, lip width, blood type, and vulnerability to malignant melanoma. Place your bets. Okay, the girls are placing their bets. Hmm, looks like Brianna's got a lot of chips on the board. Aaron is next to nothing. Now they're spinning the wheel. And Molly wins! Oh no, not those eyebrows on my baby. Chris for those out right now. What? Are you really going to risk editing my chromosome? What if it messes something up? It doesn't work every time, you know? You could replace your eyebrows with mine. Oh, please. How dare you? Whatever. I still want the chromosome. And I choose Aaron's chromosome number nine to complete the pair. Uh, next, we'll play for chromosome 17. Looks like the carrier type is shaping up. We'll check back in with them a little later. Now let's hit the streets to hear from some of the protesters outside the Cas 9 Protesters are gathering to voice their outrage towards what some are calling the next eugenics movement. This Cas 9 needs to be shut down now before we raise an entire generation of elitist superhumans. Our government should promote equality, but this government-run Cas9 is promoting rampant inequality. Some say they fear being further stripped of their reproductive rights. Others are comparing this to the 2020 reversal of Roe v. Wade. Cas9 are mining all of our genetic information and selling it to the highest bidder. They say they want to maintain diversity, make sure our kids are healthy. They just want to control procreation. They want to decide who gets to be a human and who doesn't. Cas9 are eugenics. They don't want impurities. They don't want my imperfections. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We're going to be living in a surveillance state. Science holds the key to our security and prosperity as a nation. This is me. My DNA. People are being arrested simply to get their samples onto the National DNA Database. Police can take DNA samples without a warrant. From anyone they arrest, certain segments of the population will be subject to genetic surveillance. Me. 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 You don't have to have done anything wrong. You're all screwed. Invisible, 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 invisible. Sometimes I wish I was invisible. Have you ever wanted to be invisible?
invisible. Describing it. Uh, you, you can describe it. Maria, go ahead and turn on your video. It's got the eye. I see after you are. Oh, there you are. Um, man, I don't hear you. I'm not talking. Okay, good. I'm just mouthing the words. <laughs> and now the moment we've all been waiting for it's time to announce this year's winners of the bio design challenge 2020 i would like to call onto stage maria stadler to announce the winner of mana prize for the future of beauty maria's vice president of marketing at mana products Mana took a big chance on us this year uh, by asking us to imagine the future of beauty. And I actually think as a result, we all learned a lot about uh, the beauty industry from Maria's team and uh, their expertise. So Maria, please go ahead. Thanks, Dan. Hi, I'm Maria, and I have the privilege and pleasure today of presenting the Mana Prize for the Future of Beauty. For those of you who don't know, MANA is the world's leading partner for innovative development and manufacturing of branded and private label uh, beauty products. At MANA, our culture has always been one of exploration, inspiration, ideation, and innovation. We always look forward to what's new and what's next in all industries, as well as in design, ingredient and manufacturing technologies, and socio-cultural trends to bring newness into the beauty sector. The opportunity to be the sponsor of the bio, a sponsor of the Biodesign Challenge and to see the incredible concepts presented by the participating students has both been refreshing and thought provoking for us all. The challenge we issued to the teams was to help the beauty industry create a more beautiful and sustainable bio future for ourselves and the planet. The objective was very state, straightforward, sustainability with superiority. We asked you to consider all aspects of beauty including how biotech and design can positively influ influence manufacturing and distribution of beauty products. And we encouraged you to envision new products, their ingredients and packaging, as well as how they function, how they're produced, and how they're disposed of after use. Each of the participating teams brought their own unique perspectives and research to light, and our MANA laboratories were not disappointed. The two finalist teams, the Universidad de Los Andes and UC Davis, oh Davis, sorry, UC Davis stood out amongst their competitors for exceptional research and development of new sustainable, animal-free, clean, functional cosmetic ingredients. Both teams did exceptional work under very difficult circumstances, but we were only allowed to choose one. So after much deliberation, Mana chose the Linneo Nourishing Beauty Team from the Universidad de Los Andes in Colombia as the winner of the 2020 MANA Prize for the Future of Beauty. The Linneo team's extensive research into and the production of multiple fungi as viable, sustainable raw materials for cosmetics demonstrated true thought leadership. And their, and their additional development of biodegradable packaging from upcycled materials helped secure their win in this year's competition. Congratulations to the entire Linneo team and to their amazing instructors. Your brilliant work and dedication are sure to make the world a more beautiful place. Thank you. Congratulations to the Linneo team. Next up, I'm going to invite uh, John Tracy from Science Sandbox to announce the winners of the Science Sandbox Prize for Public Engagement. John is a program and media officer at Sand Science Sandbox, which is actually a, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Um, John, if you can join me, uh, go ahead and turn your video on. And again, thank you so much for doing this with us this year. 
course. Thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm John from Science Sandbox, as Dan mentioned. Uh, and I'm, I'm so excited to present this award. Um, and it's an award that we sponsor um, because we believe that the future of biotechnology, uh, just like the future of, of any science, uh, any field of science, uh, is a democratic one. Uh, it's science must be for uh, and conducted by everyone. Uh, and biotech is certainly no exception, exception to that. Uh, it demands to be accessible. Uh, it demands public understanding of its implications for the future. Uh, and the projects submitted this year uh, do an amazing job, um, whether in artistic context, in, in uh, you know, a sort of museum exhibit context or, or citizen science context, uh, of placing biotech uh, in engaging and exciting real world situations. Uh, so we received some really phenomenal and, and exciting submissions this year, especially considering uh, the state of things. I, I personally was so impressed um, by what everyone was able to accomplish in, in a short amount of time. Um, but the winner, and a special congrats, uh, is uh, Microbial Memories from IDM at NYU, uh, a group that really found um, some interesting and, and innovative ways to, to play with the science of terroir. Um, and, and the way we experience smells and tastes um, from places that we couldn't possibly um, have experienced ourselves firsthand. So, so congratulations to them. Thank you, John. Um, and of course, congratulations to NYU IDM. Next up, we're gonna call Corinne Takara onto the screen to share uh, the winner of the Outstanding Instructor Award. Corinne won the uh, instructor, Outstanding instruction, Instructor Award last year. Uh, she is a San Francisco-based artist and educator who leads Nest Makerspace um, and every year astounds our staff with the dedication that she shows to her students and, um, and to the program. So uh, Corinne, take it away. Yes, thank you so much. It is such an honor and privilege to be giving this award this year. Um, there is nothing like being recognized by your own students um, in any awards. This is a really special award. Um, and this year's recipients helped his students push boundaries. So I read the letters that the students submitted and they were really wonderful. I won't read them, um, but I will share a few snippets. Um, so one of the statements shared that um, this year's recipient helped his students push boundaries in a very difficult time. Um, and he made things fun and engaging. And he brought his own journey from architecture to biotech to genetics. Uh, bringing that lens into their journey was really instrumental in providing the students with feedback to create a holistic design projects. And the winner is Dr. Oli Kostatis. So congratulations for um, really being a wonderful mentor. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, Alex, why don't you join us? Hi, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to announce the Community Choice Prize. Uh, so this is a new prize this year that we introduced into the competition. Uh, a lot of votes came in. It sounds like people were paying attention, uh, which is very exciting from all over the world. <laughs> uh, so uh, very excited to announce the community's choice is uh, Tecnologico de Monterey for their project Malgi. Uh, congratulations, Malgi team. Uh, it sounds like the community wants to get their hands on your sargassum growing kits and flower pots. Looking forward to see you where you take the project. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Congratulations, Monterey team. So excited for you. Um, we're going to move on to Elaine to Elaine Young to pronounce uh, to announce the outstanding presentation award. Uh, Elaine is a new judge this year and has just been fantastic. Uh, so thank you, Elaine, for joining. Uh, Elaine's an artist, designer, and the founder of the Labyrinth Project. Uh, her amulet jewelry actually incorporates DNA into the design. So check that out. Shameless plug there for you, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll pass it on to you. Hi, everyone. Um, many congratulations and thank you going on today. So um, I will also do the same. Uh, congratulations and thank you to all the teams and everyone who made the 2020 Biodesign Challenge possible. Um, for your resilience in overcoming all kinds of challenges, 
to be joining us from all the corners of the world for this event amidst um, everything that's going on right now. It was truly inspiring to be transported to so many visions of what um, our biodesigned futures could hold. And it's certainly no small feat to dare to dream, to be fortunate enough to find people who share your vision, to then dream together and make something real. These are indeed extraordinary fertile times, and I hope that this experience will manifest action in your communities and beyond. Please continue to dream, fail, make, fail again and again, and keep going. Being together in person to share this experience would have been truly very wonderful. So we'll all just have to come back for 2021. And so um, it is with much gratitude to all of you for sharing this moment with me and awarding the prize for outstanding presentation. The winning team this year are four students with diverse backgrounds that took us on a journey into the future where we might find some new names on like for food on the menu alongside dodo, dinosaur, mammoth, and unicorn meat. Yes, unicorn meat. They made us laugh and worried, but ultimately tantalized our taste buds into dreaming of a culinary future that combined traditional architectural and cooking techniques with synthetic biology to create a new type of kitchen within the built environment. The prize for outstanding presentation goes to Kalina by the Hub for Biotechnology in the Built Environment from Newcastle University and Northumbria University. Congratulations. Dodo meat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Elaine. Uh, congratulations, Kalina. Fantastic work. Uh, Todd Kukin is going to announce uh, the field research um, prize. Todd is a senior research scholar at Genetic Engineering Society Center at North Carolina State University. He's also been a judge with us since the first competition. So he's, he's now uh, a veteran of, of biodesign challenge. Todd, take it away. So I just want to add my congratulations to all the teams um, this year for, again, really inspiring us and making us feel. Um, as an environmental scientist, you know, we tend to be doom and gloom a lot about our features. And I just want to thank you all and all the teams for, for sort of giving us some inspiration and hope for what our features might look like. Um, I, am, I am sort of happy to, to say that, that we're in your hands to help us solve the problems. And I think we're, we're going to be, we're going to be all right moving forward. Um, so, as I mentioned, I was a, a former environmental scientist and a field scientist um, specifically. So my lab was actually outside um, and I had to be dragged kicking and screaming actually be brought inside to do to do work. Um, and so as you probably learned over this semester, sort of designing, thinking um, and developing um, either your projects and products that are actually going to be brought out into the world that it's important to actually understand what that world looks like and the people who live in that world. So the Outstanding Field Research Prize um, goes to, the, to a team that really took the initiative to, to go out into the field, which was a little bit different this year in the sort of face of, of coronavirus, um, to interview experts and others and potentially affected communities to really understand and find out what the actual impacts of their project would be. Um, so this year's winner um, of the Outstanding Field Research Prize uh, goes to the University of Cincinnati and their life break. So congratulations. Thank you, Todd. Congratulations, life break. Next up, we have the Outstanding Science Prize. Uh, Naomi Nakayama is going to present it. Naomi is a former instructor, now judge. She's a biologist at Imperial College, uh, where she works on biological form and function and actually heads up the lab there. Thank you so much, Naomi. Take it away. Thank you, Dan. Um, it's my great pleasure to be um, presenting this award. Um, before announcing the, the, uh, yeah, the recipient, I would like to um, say that um, as uh, one of the many, many scientists on the judge panel of the judges, um, every year, um, or as an instructor, former instructor, every year I come to 
biodesign challenge and get you know completely sort of blown away um because um yeah the projects are something that the um biologists uh wouldn't think of many of them and but very provocative thought provoking and cutting edge and a very very future foreseeing of a future and i have to think um what are we missing uh, as a scientist, not being able to do what you guys do. Um, yeah, uh, and also <laughs> we tend to think to become a scientist, we have to have those long, long years of training and to think, you know, in a scientific method and critical analytical thinking and, you know, you must do this, you need this, you need the lab, or you need, you know, you, you have to do that. And then, um, yeah, come to biodesign challenge, and then you realize, no, that's probably not the most important thing. The most important thing is probably that, you know, what you guys bring, you guys have um, the enthusiasm about what the living organisms can do, but also the gumption, the can-do attitude, and, you know, all that that we soak up at the biodesign challenge and get, you know, um, inspired and then you know sort of jazzed up and then go home and um yeah ponder you know how how we can be like you guys um <laughs> anyways uh so um yeah this year i think it was really hard uh for uh, doing um scientific uh part of the project because it's probably hard always to find a space to do the science for many of the teams. But this year, you know, with a lockdown, it was particularly hard. But again, you guys proved to us maybe access to the lab isn't the most, you know, important thing to do an interesting, provocative, you know, like amazing as a project in bioscience. So, um, yeah, so without the further ado, um, this year's uh, science, Best Science Award goes to um, Kent State University, BioBlack. Um, it's new ways to, sustainable ways to use a bacteria to uh, stay at uh, the textile, especially the difficult color, the black. And they did an amazing amount of reiterative uh, research in kitchen, basically. And um, yeah, uh, hats off and uh, congratulations. Congratulations, BioBlack. Thank you, Naomi. Huh. This year, the judges came together and chose not to award the Outstanding Social Critique Prize. They felt that no team fully embodied the intention of the prize. Uh, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that on Saturday with our instructors. They did, however, devise a new prize, the Judges Recognition Award. So it's my pleasure to invite Karen Hogan to present the prize. Karen is the co-founder of BioRealize and a former professor of biology at University of Pennsylvania. She is BioDesign Challenges Executive Board President. Thank you, Karen, for your devotion to the program. Uh, she's been with us literally since day one, um, and it's my pleasure to have you on with us. Go, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. I can't believe it's been five years. Congratulations to the BDC organization. Um, we're in kindergarten and, and we're growing up. <laughs> um, I would be re remiss before I award this prize without, um, as board president, acknowledging Dan, Vina, and Alex and the amazing work they've done to pull off BDC this year. When we were looking at the prizes and the teams this year, we were blown away by the scope of the projects, the ambition, the creativity. And as judges, we kept coming back and back to this idea of concept, presentation, reflection, and context that we asked you students to work on. Um, as we grappled with runner-up and outstanding prize, a third team kept appearing on our radar that we felt really needed to walk away with this competition with our recognition as judges. Uh, the judging team is comprised of highly accomplished professionals, everybody from the sciences to the arts to design to critical um, policy making. So this is truly an honor to be recognized by who will soon be your colleagues um, in the biodesign world. Uh, we really appreciate and have seen, especially behind the scenes as the board, the hard work that the students have put in, that the faculty put in, 
that the bio design team does to support your teams. And so I could drag this out and hold everybody on edge, um, but I am very, very pleased as one of the judges representing all of the judges today to award our Judges' Choice Award to Parsons School of Design for Tom Tex. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Congratulations, Tom Tex. Um, I'm gonna ask Vina and Alex to come on and present the runner up. Make sure I'm unmuted. All right. So thanks for everyone for tuning in. The moment is almost here, um, but we will now announce the runner up. Uh, before we do, we just want to take a moment to say yet another congratulations to all of the teams uh, all over the world at different universities and high schools and maker spaces that have spent their academic semesters sometimes longer. Uh, envisioning the future of medicine and energy and water and so many other areas. Um, your work is invaluable and you should feel really great about what you've accomplished. So the Biodesign Challenge 2020 Summit runner up is California College of the Arts Algae Filter. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yay! All right, well, I'll bring it back to you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vina. Thank you, Alex. Congratulations, team. Okay, we are now at the final prize, the, the winner of the overall prize, the glass microbe. This year, we don't actually have the glass microbe here in New York. It is uh, still in Columbia uh, with our students at Sudafreeze. So students, instructors, if you can come on, go ahead and start your video. Um, Carolina Obergon and Giovanna Danis are co-instructors of the Universidad de los Andes teams. Uh, their team, Sudafreeze, is on as well. They were, of course, the winner of last year's challenge. And along with the students, uh, they're going to announce this year's overall winner of the program. Take it away. Thank you, Dan. This is so exciting. The Biodesign Challenge has increased our students' interest for sciences and made visible the power of creative fields. Being part of the BBC community is a privilege. Congratulations to all finalists, and I'm already looking forward to next year's projects. Hello, everyone. Uh, I have the honor today to announce the overall winner of the Biodesign Challenge 2020. So it's so exciting. College for Creative Studies Zebra Glass. Congratulations. Congratulations. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, students. Uh, thank you, instructors. Thank you, judges. What a year, what a crazy year. Uh, I just wanna thank our sponsors and partners one more time, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, Science Sandbox, MANA, Biofuels Digest, Ginkgo Bioworks. Uh, a special huge thanks to our technical producers at Argus HD. Honestly, none of this week would have happened without you guys, and you have been working around the clock to make this function, and I think it functioned beautifully. And finally, I have to give a special thanks to Alex and Vina. Um, you guys, honestly, in a handful of months pulled together a whole new type of program that really the entire world has been trying to figure out for <laughs> the last five months and you pulled it off beautifully. Nice. Thank you so much for being on the team. Thank you so much for uh, fostering the students and the millions of emails you must have sent. Um, certainly this year will be unforgettable. Um, and I, although I haven't been in your presence now for five months, uh, we've been working on this together for every day. Um, yeah. And I, I can't be more grateful. Thank you so much. But thank you too, Dan, as always. You're, thank you're for making yeah. us have it online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and as always, like your, your leadership is what makes us great employees, right? Great organizers and, and yeah. Thank so you. we appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, guys, it's time to start thinking about BDC 2021. Enjoy your summers. 
enjoy, I hope you enjoyed the last couple of days. Um, it will all be aired online or it'll all be sitting online for you to enjoy again, maybe, or for the first time. Thank you again. Uh, we will be seeing you soon. See y'all very soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.